Thank you. We're now live on YouTube and we are now being recorded on WebEx. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the December 3rd, 2021 meeting on the Commission of Forensic Science. At this time, I would like to introduce two new members to the Commission. The first is our chair, Rosanna Rosado, acting commissioner of DCJS. Commissioner Rosado joined DCJS earlier this week and um, after serving on the New York's Secretary of State since 2016. During her time at the Department of State, she was a key member of the governor's administration and carried out many significant initiatives, including social justice reform, as well as economic and community revitalization across the state. Commissioner Rosado also has been at the forefront of the state's reentry and reintegration efforts for justice involved people and led the Council on Community Reentry and Reintegration of New Yorkers. I know the commissioner also would like to say a few words, so I'll turn the floor over to her now. Commissioner. Thank you. Let me unmute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dooley, and um, great to be with you all today. I'm going to say at the end of my very brief remarks, I'm going to turn this back over to you, Dr. Dooley. I want to say that now because if I do get knocked out um, due to the wind, um, I would like for you to continue the meeting and we will add my remarks to the record or, or we will email it out to the members. Okay. It's a pleasure to be with you and the rest of the Commission on Forensic Science on my fourth day as commissioner. For me, the journey to uh, now um, uh, to, to lead DCJS is a culmination of a lifelong personal and professional passion for criminal justice reform in the broadest spectrum. Earlier in my life, I was a media executive, editor, publisher, and producer, and I was always moved by the stories of how society treats it's most vulnerable. This inspired me to join many advocacy efforts and advise community-based organizations that were driving change within their communities. In fact, it inspired me to leave my CEO job in 2013 and to seek a role in criminal justice. So here I am. In 2016, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to join state service and work on reentry and reintegration issues for justice-involved people that focus grew in part from my time as a distinguished lecturer at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where I taught courses also in several of New, um, in several New York State prisons. Now, this new role presents an opportunity to partner with you and others within the criminal justice field to move our justice system forward and ensure that it works fairly equitably and efficiently for all New Yorkers. As we continue our efforts together, please do not hesitate to reach out to me, to Executive Deputy Commissioner Joe Popkin, who's on today, and to Dr. Dooley. I'm tremendously excited to join DCJS. I'm especially excited about this division and this meeting and, um, and to chair this commission. However, today, as authorized by Robert's rules and not precluded by the bylaws, and in order to preserve order, I will ask Dr. Dooley to walk us through the business of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to introduce uh, New York State Police Superintendent Kevin Bruin, who's joined us for the meeting today. Um, he is on audio, I believe. Uh, Superintendent Bruin has been appointed as the representative of the law enforcement to the commission. So just as we have in the past, I would like to take attendance to establish a quorum. Um, as we're all virtual, we will need to conduct the business today through the typical roll call. So please respond present when I call on you. Uh, Commissioner Rosado? Present. Dr. Buffalino? Present. Mr. Castro? Present. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Present. Ms. Goldthwaite? Present. Judge Mazzarelli? Present. Dr. Marciano? Present. Uh, Mr. Oster? Present. Superintendent Bruin? Present. And Dr. Willie? Present. Thank you. And including myself, we have established a quorum. And we'll start with the agenda. Uh, I will start rolling with the review and approval of the meeting agenda. 
you all received an updated draft agenda for today's meeting. Um, is there any discussion regarding the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion from Judge and a second from Ben. Um, please state your vote for the record when I call upon you. Uh, my vote is aye. Commissioner Rosado? Abstain. Abstain. Dr. Buffalino? Aye. Mr. Castro? Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Aye. Ms. Goldthwaite? Aye. Judge Mazzarelli? Aye. Dr. Marciano? Aye. Mr. Oster? Aye. Superintendent Bruin? Abstain. And Dr. Willie? Aye. With that, I believe the motion carries. All right, moving on. Next, we have the review and approval of the draft minutes from the September 17th, uh, 2021 meeting. You've received those draft minutes. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the September 17th meeting? So moved. Fitz has made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. And Anne has seconded the motion. All right, please state your vote for the record uh, when called upon. My vote is aye. Commissioner Rosado? Abstain. Um, Pat, we're going to get less formal, so I'm just going to call you Pat. Pat? Thank you. <laughs> aye. Lydia? Aye. Bill? Aye. Jessica? Aye. Judge? Aye. Uh, Mike? Aye. Ben? Abstain. Um, Superintendent? Abstain. And Ann? Aye. Okay, with that, the motion carries. So we will jump right into our next item on the agenda, which is accreditation and laboratory updates. Um, starting first with the Erie County Medical um, Examiner's Office Forensic Toxicology Laboratory. Um, the laboratory has named uh, Melissa Bowler as the interim chief toxicologist effective um, 1029 upon the resignation of their chief toxicologist, Christine Giffen. Also, Toxicologist 3, Lawrence Perkins, has resigned effective 11-2. Um, um, the um, external accrediting body, a &E -B, or ABFT, sorry, um, acknowledged receipt of the notification and requested Melissa Bowler's uh, CV. The CV was received and acknowledged also by ABFT. We also have an additional update that was a late document, um, effective December 6th, um, Colleen Corcoran will be the interim chief toxicologist. Do we have any questions for the lab? Does that bring them up to full staff now? I mean, in terms of management? I don't believe so. I mean, they, they have the interim, they have an interim chief toxicologist, but they don't have a a permanent chief toxicologist. We can talk to them if you'd like. You want, to, you want me to get them on? No, no, that's okay. Okay. Jill, one thing, and it's it's not even a, a big issue, is just that uh, Melissa Bowler just needs to update her footer in her email to uh, Tox2. It, that, that would match it up with her CV. Okay. I don't think it's a big deal, but I figured I'd say something. Noted. Any other questions or comments? Moving on, we have the Nassau County Medical Examiner Division of Forensic Services. Um, the laboratory received a surveillance document review um, October 1st. There were no findings. The external accrediting body, ANAB, has sent a letter of continuation of accreditation. Um, I would congratulate them on their no findings uh, and ask if anyone has any questions or comments.
Hearing none. Moving swiftly along, we have the New York City OCME Department of Forensic Biology. Um, the laboratory received a surveillance assessment and a scope extension October 6th of this year. Again, there were no findings. Um, the external accrediting body, ANAB, has sent a letter of continued accreditation, certificate, and scope. I would congratulate them on their efforts and ask if there are any questions or comments for the lab. I actually have one comment on the fluorescent spectroscopy. I was, just, I was wondering if, if they are labeling their spermatozoa with fluorescent tags or was it P30 ELISA? Just wasn't sure what that was in their uh, uh, key equipment and technology. I believe we have Meredith on the phone if she could signify by raising her hand and we can have her speak to that. Maybe we don't. That's okay. Shelly, do you know? Do you see, I do see Craig O'Connor on the list. He may be able to answer that question. Craig, would you be able to raise your hand? Or Elizabeth, maybe put in. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Hi, Craig, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I could not find the hand raising function. <laughs> um, Sorry, Pat, can you repeat that question real quick? Yeah. So in the key equipment and technology, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I hope everything's well. Um, yeah. The key equipment and technology, fluorescent spectroscopy, are you guys labeling your spermatozoa and doing fluorescent searches? Are you doing an automated system? Or is We're, we are, we are, is it? We are labeling them. I mean, we, at this point, do sperm searches, uh, not really routinely, uh, kind of on, request, but we are uh, doing a staining of that for Sparazoa, and then we will also do a, a Seratec card for the presence of PSA. Okay, so in terms of the the sperm search, do you, are you guys using an automated platform that would search, or are you guys no, just by hand? No, that's still a manual staining and microscopy search. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else for OCME? All right, again, uh, once again, congratulations. We'll move on in the agenda. Um, next, we have the New York City Police Department Police Laboratory. Um, they had a reassessment from ANAB um, the week of October 25th, 2021. The laboratory did receive five findings. Uh, it appears one was regarding their trace evidence section and uh, four others were regarding their um, drug chemistry. I think it might be best if we have Scott, uh, Dr. O'Neill, if you're on, raise your hand so we can have you speak to this and um, ask any questions. Stephanie is unmuted. Yes. I'm, I'm with Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So, good as morning. Uh, Joe said, we went through our assessment. We had five findings. Currently, we're actually challenging four of those findings. Um, so, I would um, welcome to take any questions on any of the findings. Uh, but right now, the only finding that we're not challenging is in your notes is uh, the 7.8.1. But if you'd like to have there'll be more documentation coming uh, based upon you know resolving those findings, but if you'd like to know any information just now, I'm able to take questions. Do we have any questions? I, I have a few questions. Uh, good morning. Um, I guess one general question that applies to all of the, the findings is, have they been disclosed uh, to the prosecution and the defense, or are they on a, your website, or has there been any disclosure? I do understand you're appealing four of them, uh, but regardless, has there, has there been any disclosure to affected parties? Yes, there was a discussion uh, at a meeting um, about the finding that we're not challenging, uh, the other four due to or challenging them. 
Uh, we did not feel we told them that we have five findings and four were challenging and one we're not. Um, and we're working with, uh, we told our customers, the prosecutors, that we're working with the ANEB to come up with an action plan. And that's the process we're in right now. And that includes all, all five of them, not just the one you're not appealing. No, I discussed the, the, I told them there were five findings, just that the oh. information I gave you, I gave them, there were I five see. findings. Um, has there been any independent effort to reach out to the defense or um, has it just the information just gone to the prosecution? Information to the prosecutor. Um, could I ask uh, just a, a few questions um, about the substance of a couple of these? Um, Regarding the um, footwear comparison uh, software Soulmate, um, could you just walk us through how um, your analysts actually use that software? Because I understand the basis of your appeal is that the software is a reference collection rather than a method. So I was just wondering, it might be helpful for the commission to understand how your analysts actually use it. Sure. Um, my understanding is that the way they use it is they take features from um, a footwear print, um, such as um, a pattern, uh, maybe it's a diamond pattern, or they take features um, such as the lines, and they input those features into this soft into the software. They have like icons for them to select, and then based upon that, they do a search of the database that we've purchased. And that gives a list of potential candidates of the footwear that may have these type of features. Um, of course, the more features you can put in, you would hope you would get a better search. But it really is based upon what type of features you observe, either from a footwear impression or from um, yeah, from a footwear impression. So I understand you're you're referring this as a, a reference collection, but it does seem that there's a method involved, right? That it, the well, method is the algorithm connecting an unknown, unknown features, right? From a, a crime scene evidence to known features. I understand it's, it's an investigative lead, but that is the method, right? The actual search, the connection, the purported being able to say, hey, this diamond shape belongs potentially to XYZ shoe, right? Or, or am I misunderstanding something? I know I, I would just say the algorithm is not something that the laboratory creates or mm -hmm. uh, develops. The algorithm is provided by the manufacturer. Um, and our point um, is also that this is updated software. And um, the discussion we're having is that, that, that we did verify that the algorithm was working when it was installed. Um, the level of documentation we had uh, wasn't sufficient at the time of the assessment. We've provided further documentation and our challenge. So we did verify that the algorithm should be working as per the, 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 um, sorry, the vendor. Um, but in regards to a method, or like meaning like we verify that we've, we came up with the algorithm, I just want to make clear, we, didn't, we did not develop a method. That method, if you want to use that term, which I would disagree, that's why we're challenging it. If you want to use that term, was developed by the, the vendor. So our job is to verify that the product that we purchased is a product that we, um, we got. And we believe that was done when we received that product in 2019. So my apologies, I think my screen froze, um, but I did catch, I think, the, the thrust of your answer. But Apologies if my follow up is is something you said. Um, what testing do you have you done of this uh, footwear at all? Uh, footwear program soulmate at all? Can can you say state the question again? Sorry, do, do you mean when? Have you done any testing on this software at all? Was, was yeah. the finding related to the extent of um, verification or validation of the software, yeah. or have have you done no independent testing at all? No, there was independent testing at the time with the vendor when they were doing the installation of the software. They have an installation plan where they show that uh, if you put these certain features in, this is the result you should get. And we had our examiners present while that was happening, and they also, my understanding, did it themselves. Uh, just the level of documentation of that was not sufficient at the time of the assessment. Mm. So, so that sounds more like a test run of the software rather than a formal um, validation or verification 
um, which I suppose is is the root of ANAP's finding. I would disagree, but it's more that it's you you can't we wouldn't verify how would you validate their method other than run test samples to see that you would get the expected results. And that's what was done based upon what the, the vendor does when they're installing um, their uh, software. It's like a database search. Well, but did you test that or just, uh, I understand that obviously the developers of the software tested it, but did you test it in your lab? Yes, as my understanding we did, yes. Application? Yes. Do, do you have documentation of that? Yes, and that's that's been supplied in the challenge. Uh -huh. so whether it's acceptable or not will be determined upon A and B. Okay. Uh, could you provide that to us? Um, I believe it may have been already provided. Um, so because usually any communication we have with the NEB is yeah, just if I could domestic. if I could jump in there um, during the challenge, we, there was notification that they were going to be challenged, but the actual challenge and, and all of that, um, we received documents. and it's there's in your late documents, and then we've also received additional correspondence from A and B um, earlier in the week. Again, I just want to make a note that this is an ongoing assessment activity. Um, and that you will be provided all of the any additional materials at the next meeting. Okay, th thanks, Jill. I and I did review the the paperwork and the new documents, but it did not include a what what you would think of as a verification or validation. Um, but I understand and, there's more documentation, and that's why we're challenging it because it wouldn't be a method validation because right. we don't see it as a method. <laughs> right, and around and around we go. Right. Right. Scott, can I ask a question? It would would it be more like a performance check? You're just checking the software to. Yeah, we're checking the software, making sure the software is acting as purchased. Yes. Right. So I think that's the, the difference in it, it's it's semantics, but it's not a verification or a validation has a completely different procedure than that of what a performance check would have. So, um, I I would just throw that out there. And again, ongoing. Not sure where the challenge status is at, but we will be updated on that at the next meeting. Jessica, do you have any other questions? I know Pat I do. I can move on uh, from there. Um, I did have a question um, with respect to the uh, measurement uncertainty. I, I guess that was both C's drugs and tool marks, firearm tool marks. Correct. So I did read um, your appeal in the the new materials that we were provided. Um, if you could just walk me through, um, and it was very clearly written, but I guess I just don't understand. Um, you take a, you take your, you identify sources of measurement uncertainty. You measure them every year. It sounds like you calculate it, and then you apply um, that value as, as you're supposed to, right? So it does seem like you, you listed from 2014 to the present. And you said you've observed fairly stable trends, except for 2016 and last year, 2020. Um, and I, I, my understanding of the assessment or, or of the nonconformity here is that even though you observed a greater level of measurement uncertainty in 2020, you did not actually apply that value, uh, the measured value. Um, you, you were I guess the trend value that you had observed in other years and if you could just explain why you didn't apply the value you actually calculated um, in 2020. I understand you provided some reasons, but if you could just walk through that. Sure. Um, so, um, as, as we've said a number of times, I think it's important to say it again, just that we are challenging this. So, uh, whether with the, with the challenge is accepted and rejected, then we'll act accordingly based upon that. But what we're saying is that we evaluate the standard requires us to evaluate the uncertainty each year. It does not automatically mean whatever uncertainty you calculate, you apply the following year. There can be many reasons why the uncertainty may change. So our point is that we evaluate the standard and based upon our laboratory, based upon our experience, based upon the, funk, the, the level and size of this operation, um, we determined that we were not going to change the uncertainty for the upcoming year based upon one year's measurement, where we were concerned about in the drug section that we didn't have 
um, complete data due to the seasonal changes that we observe. And um, due to COVID, not all members of the laboratory were present in the laboratory, so we couldn't collect the data at that time. And in regards to firearms, um, we did have that time prior in 2016, as you mentioned, where the uncertainty did increase. Um, but over the following three years, it decreased back to the stable value. So um, our point, and I think, like you said, hopefully it's clear in the letter, it took us a long time to make it as clear because it is complicated. And I, I am not an, an expert, so, um, but I would say that what we, what we are saying is that, you know, a laboratory of this size, where you have maybe 30 to 40 firearms examiners doing measurement on sheer uncertainty, we had a, a change of staff. We had um, an application process that we want, you know, we have more staff coming on board because we lost staff. So we felt we wanted to see what would happen this coming year before we any trends. I suppose in summary, what I'm trying to say is we felt that we should evaluate every year and perform a trend analysis and then make decisions based upon that. And I and I think the, the assessor at the time disagreed. So I, I can't, you know, I don't, I think as I tried to um, explain that we try in, in our laboratory because of such a large staff and um, we do try to take a more conservative approach and I know it's hard to say that and what does that mean but what I'm trying to say is uh, if we can um, look at the data and we look at the worst case scenario that's what we go with we go with the worst case scenario um, and you know that's not saying that you should because um, you, the data is the data but because we're such a large staff and a large operation, we tried to make sure that we uh, take any, everything we can consider and use a trend analysis to help us determine what the uncertainty would be. And just to be clear, that would be for the upcoming year. So you collect the data for this year and look, review it, and then based what you're going to make uncertainty for the upcoming year. You do not go backwards, you go forwards. So the other part is you could have an increased in uncertainty, and you should also look at why that's happening. You could also have, which, which has happened in, on occasion, a decrease in uncertainty. And in some instances, we did change the uncertainty, we did decrease it. In some instances, we kept it at the level it was at. So, again, I'm interested to see what the accrediting body states, because our interpretation of the standard is that the laboratory evaluates it. I, I don't believe, in my opinion, that it says evaluate and apply each and every year, because I think there's more to it than than that. So that was, that was clear. I, I just have one follow up question. Um, I, I understand uh, the trend analysis and looking over time uh, and considering how much data you have to make the decision. Um, but I guess, right, like if you observed in uh, the admittedly maybe more limited data set you had in 2020, an increase in measurement uncertainty. Like for this, and I'm sorry, I, it's hard for me to formulate this, but maybe for the same reasons you're feeling you don't have enough data because of the upheaval with COVID, could those same reasons affect measurement uncertainty or are they completely separate? Do you know what I mean? Like, how do you know this increase in measurement uncertainty isn't real, isn't really there and should be reported so that uh, the customers of the reports sure. have an accurate sense of the yeah. you know, level of confidence to have in the results? And I think that's why we look at the historic data. <laughs> that's why we look at the trends. You know, we look at the stability that we've seen over the past number of years. But our biggest contributor to uncertainty, and again, I don't want to misstate things because when I meet with my people to talk about it, it's very technical. Um, um, but what I would say is our biggest contributor is generally the analyst driven. So, you know, when you have a turnover of personnel, that can affect it. Now, we train people to a level of, you know, before they complete their training, they have to show that they have this level of measurement assurance when it comes to it. But over a period of time, that can change, and that's what we're monitoring. That's why we choose to monitor every year. Um, so I think I think you're right. Uh, you don't know the answer, but that's the point. The point is to look at what could the answer be, and part of that for us is to look at historical data. And I think if if you if you say I'm just making up a value now, the number five. So our uncertainty is five, and now it's twenty five. Well, I think we have to work out what happened there. But if a number is five and now it's six, well, I know as a laboratory that we've chosen to be extremely conservative in our values. So the actual, and I, I hate to use this term, but I'm, behind, I'm trying to explain it better, but the true value is three. 
The true uncertainty is kind of three if you actually did it without being conservative. So for fluctuating between five and six, I'm not that concerned. There's inherent nature, so I want to do a trend analysis. So I see five, six, seven, eight. It's true, clearly there's a trend of increasing and some action needs to be taken. The question is, when does that action be taken? And I think, unfortunately, that's a decision myself and my team make um, to make it what we think is appropriate at that time, based upon the data that we have in front of us. Thank you for that. Um, and the only other questions I have um, really relate to disclosure with respect to the C's drugs uh, finding um, regarding proficiency tests. And I understand you know, your position is, look, in the normal course of casework, um, this certain calculation is done by our quality unit and not the individual analysts, so we just follow casework procedures. Um, do, do people getting the lab report, like prosecution defense, do, is that known? Um, or is there a separate, I guess my question really is, is there a separate proficiency testing of the quality unit for doing what they do? So, I think it was a couple of questions there, maybe, and I, I want to make sure I want to make sure I address them. Um, yeah, I switch midstream. All right, that's right. right. I, I think I can answer the last one first. Yeah, please. Uh, so, in regards to proficiency tests for QA personnel, so I think first we have to not use that term because proficiency testing or comp, uh, is for um, testing work, right? That's for testing work for people performing testing. What you may be asking is, are or quality assurance people review to make sure they're doing, they're doing the right work, right? They're doing, if I understand correctly. So that goes part of our internal audit. In our internal audit, we review the standards to make sure we're meeting those standard requirements. The other part is that the, the, the calculation that we're talking about, um, one of them, the conversion, is multiplied by 0 0.892. That's the calculation, multiplied by that number. The, the other calculation, which is due to us multiplying by 0.892, what happens is your uncertainty range has to change. So they're using our, our practice in the laboratory. It's nothing they're using unique. You know, it's actually what the laboratory uses, but they're using it in the quality assurance unit. Did that make sense? Jessica, I'm not sure if I answered that right there. No, no, no. I, you did a better job answering than I did asking. Um, I guess it just seems. There's a part, and I get if it's just multiplying by a number, you, you know, I, I, I think the point is it's not rocket science, but still, if the proficiency test provider is saying this is part of the test, this is part of passing uh, the proficiency test, and then certain individuals do that part, I, I guess, are they ever proficient, those individuals proficiency tested in doing that? I mean, I understand your point that it's, I, I it's a simple test, conversion. The, the, the proficiency test provider, is providing us with cocaine hydrochloride. Mm -hmm. And when we perform our analysis in the laboratory, we could reproduce reports based upon cocaine base. The proficiency test provider does not provide us with cocaine base to do the testing. So we're, we're meeting that requirement because they're asking us to do that calculation. But in regards to the standard, this, that's a proficiency test provider. They, they are trying to meet the standard, and maybe we can talk to them about it. But as regards to standard, what we're saying is standard says is, are you proficiency testing individuals to what they do in their job? And what they do in their job is report cocaine base purity. So we did not want to intermix those and cause confusion with the examiners because every purity we report is in the base form. Um, I think there's something to learn from it. But I think the way that the, the, one of the main reasons we're challenging it, it feels like they're saying that our people aren't properly proficiency tested. And I disagree wholeheartedly. You know, our people are reporting their values um, as they would do in casework. And then the provider, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating what I wrote in the letter, but, but what the provider's asking is for you to, to, to report it in the hydrochloride form. Um, and so therefore we're doing that simple conversion. Uh, thanks. Yeah. It, so this does seem like something that would need to be disclosed to the defense. I understand you're, you know, you have your explanation on appealing it and there hasn't been a final determination by ANAB, but while we're in this liminal stage, right? I, this is information uh, since we get proficiency testing results on discovery uh, that would definitely uh, be relevant for defenders to have. I, 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 you know, I think I have to take more thought to that, but I would just bring to your point is, 
Did the, the point of the proficiency test result is did they successfully pass the proficiency test? And the answer is yes, they did. So that's one of the reasons why we're challenging. We feel the language is, is incorrect and that it gives the impression. And I don't think that was the, the point of the assessor. I don't think they were, they were looking at reading the standard and uh, um, not in regards to like, or you have people who fail the proficiency test. There are under the answer. That's not that's not accurate. There's no one had an unsuccessful proficiency test. So when it comes to discovery, discovery is requirement of results of a, a proficiency test. What was the result of it? Was it successful or unsuccessful? And of course, if it's unsuccessful, disclose it. If it's successful, disclose it. But in regards to how we get to that successful, unsuccessful, um, that's something that you know is the process we go through. Um, And it's a whole nother conversation, but that's why it's really important for the substance of these tests to be disclosed. But that's a whole nother conversation. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Pat, did you have any questions? I thought you did. Yeah, I, most of them have been answered, so uh, thank you. But Scott, I do have, I, I want to go back to the, the soulmate. Did, did, Whomever was um, being, um, I guess, interviewed during that process of determining whether uh, the database itself was verified or not, did you guys just not provide the vendor's paperwork? We provided, we provided very limited paperwork. We were in the process of getting more paperwork from the vendor. Unfortunately, okay. the individual who had been working at that time had recently resigned, um, so it became a little bit more longer process. Uh, we, and so, I, I, so that's that, that's the answer. Okay. So we've submitted additional paperwork, and if if the challenge is not accepted, then we will do a verification and document that verification. We feel it's already been done, but we're not supposed to act do an action plan until we receive from NAB they've approved their action plan. So the next step is: do you approve a challenge or not? They decline. They say this challenge is not accepted. Our plan is, of course, to develop an action plan, which would be. As uh, Jessica was saying, like verify. Well, I will use the word verify, not method. Verify this um, reference collection, and then move forward from there. Okay. So the and and I I've never used Soulmate. We don't have Trace here. So I mean, I understand the database, but <clears throat> is there the is there a potential in that database to have some type of a control within the unknown side, and then compare it to a known so well, that... I think that I think that's what the I, in fact I, I don't have my uh, my kind of like, matter expert uh, yeah, in, kind in of like the Niven database but, but I but I, my understanding is that's what they did at the installation they use oh. something that they know is there and they and the, what they're doing is is uh, just to be clear they're putting in features so they're not putting in a scanned image of a footwear impression and searching it against the database they're putting in okay I see diamonds so click a diamond box I see squares click a square box so it's not actually, it's a descriptor of the footwear impression. It's not actually the footwear impression is being scanned and searched against the database. If I, just, I looking at, clear about that. just looking at particular patterns and seeing yeah, whether. Like can... So the, if you put in, it's a, it's a diamond pattern with a swoosh mark, <laughs> then you would assume that the database is going to come back with potential Nike. <laughs> but there may be other, other manufacturers that have a, a tick you know, um, as as a feature, but we're not like I said. We're it's really describing what they're seeing and using the the categories that the vendors decided that they use as an algorithm to search that database. Okay, All right, understood. I was just I was because I I was just a little confused as to why the the paperwork wasn't presented. But it sounds like the vendor is in the process of putting the paperwork together to support the criteria. What was what was what was provided at the time. Um, did not reflect a, 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 a going to NED enough paperwork to show. So again, we were also disagreeing as as we we're discussing about it's not a method; it's actually a reference collection. So and that discussion went to the end of the the last day, and then of course went into the report. So it's not like um, you know we're not wholeheartedly agreeing with this interpretation right now. Okay. But again, we don't feel there's any concern about the database because the database was checked back in 2019. What we're maybe lacking is sufficient documentation, but we have to wait to go through this um, ongoing process. Understood. Understood. Um, the next question I have has to do with the transfer of evidence. It was the 
411 nonconformity, where in the discipline of seized drugs, uh, essentially, I think it was just uh, where I guess something was not in a chain of custody, it was somewhere in purgatory. Did you guys add some transfer storage area within the limbs? When no, uh, but I think this is this is a this is something we're, 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 we 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 discussed with the assessor numerous okay. times during the course, and that what we're seeing is that our anal our analysis is conducted, and the process of analysis, the certain types of evidence may be left on the instrument, um, overnight, and the the expectation was that that custody should be documented. Um, and in certain cases, but not all cases, which did not make any sense. It has to be oh, this, was the work, this was the work product, not yes. the actual, the substance itself, not the bulk substance. No, this is what the was, in, was in, extracted in methanol and on the yes. order sampler. Yes, but but the point right. was it was residue. The point was it was residue. So they're saying the entire work product is now that product. Right. So so right now we think this is. Uh, this is a like I said. It, we don't believe there's any loss of chain of custody. Uh, right. I don't. It's not even now that you explained it. I I don't, I don't even have a question about it anymore. I okay. I thought it was on the bulk product or the parent product itself. No, no, no. We have chain of custody. It's the it's the, it's the working product that's been extracted in methanol or whatever yes. substance that has been placed in the auto sampler. Yes, correct. Okay. Um. So the. Next question I have is 761, and I'm sorry if some of these start to overlap. Um, in the discipline seized drugs, firearms, tool marks, uh, identified the contributions to measurement uncertainty. So the, the, the question I have is this, is uh, generally when, and I, I know the QA department determines the budgets and so forth, whether it's atmospheric, whether it's equipment and so forth, whether it's uh, human and so forth. Um, the what's the current process? Does it does the QA department uh, get a review of the budgets and then they themselves, or does somebody else incorporate that budget into limbs so that within the report there's no mathematics by the examiner? It's all done through the algorithms of limbs. Okay. So is, that, is how do you guys how are your uncertainties accounted for? Are you are you showing? The, the the average, the high and low, the plus and minus on your reports? Like, how do you report them? And I mean, I can, I can definitely discuss that. I don't know the relevance to that standard in regards to what the assessor was bringing up. It was more about how we are evaluating it. But okay. it depends upon the section and, and for the, and the drug section, of course, when it comes to um, milligram cocaine charges uh, or aggregate weight charges uh, as presented and the instances of where it may impact the case and that near felony weight charges and um, the uncertainty is placed. But if you have 10 ounces of cocaine and the highest felony weight charge is eight ounces, we evaluate the uncertainty in our, in our notes and our worksheet using a, a verified um, spreadsheet. And then that's documented in the notes, but the final product is the, is the weight. Okay, is the weight itself. All right, but this is not something that you guys, once the, the budget changes, and I guess the question that I'm asking is, if this becomes or remains a non-conformance, right? Let's say you, you go and you so try to if, change. If it remains a non-conformance, our plan is to reevaluate. Um, you know, from the assessment team, one of the points was that if the value goes up, you should change it. If the value should go down, you should change it. And I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Um, so I think I'm looking to see what their response is, but okay. if it comes back that they believe that our evaluation is not, um, our actions were not sufficient, then of course we'll take action. So we will look at the values that we have, determine, and again, this all has to go through NAV, where we'll say that this is our plan and this is our implementation. And if it's to uh, change the uncertainty, then of course we would. If our plan is not to, then we wouldn't. But I think from our point of view, as, as I've already said, and I apologize, is, or from our point of view, is we've, we evaluated it. Now, whether you think it's right or wrong, that's a different story, but we evaluated it. And I think my main thing is I don't think we feel there's any issue in our work product because we do have all this data to support our decisions. It's just maybe you disagree with our decision. Okay. And if you disagree, but we want to maintain accreditation, then we're going to change our decision. 
Remember right, and at the same time, we're going to receive the information anyway. So it, right. it, it's it's an open it's an open um, yes. it's an open argument at this point. Um, I think you guys answered my question on the measurement of uncertainty and the quality unit regarding PTs and how it should be done the same way. Because I was, I'm not a I'm not a, a chemist, but um, I was a little I was just wondering why. Uh, Wondering why um, even the salt was being considered when it came to quants, but you've already answered that that question, so I, it's not even a question. Uh, I think then the last one is reduce the seized drug test, and that and that was quite. I, I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I think that was everyone who had any questions. Um, if so, can you? Just press star three to unraise your hand for some housekeeping. Thank you so much. All right, so we'll move on to the next item, which is the Niagara County Sheriff's Office of Forensic Laboratory. We have a couple of points on here. Um, at the September 17th uh, Commission on Forensic Science meeting, we expressed concern for the laboratory and requested ANAB to conduct an on site interim assessment activity. Um, ANAB conducted the assessment and there were five findings. Um, the laboratory has until January 9th to resolve these non conformities. Um, the lead assessor has approved three of the corrective action plans and three of the proposed corrective action plans addi uh, required additional work. Um, what I would like to do, I think at this time is have the lab director, uh, the new lab director, Christine Giffen, step on and and speak to this. If you could raise your hand, Christine, we can unmute you. There she is. Thanks, Christine, you're muted. Thank okay. you very much. I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. All right. Um, if you could just do me a favor and take us through the findings that there were, um, it looks like there were six findings. Sure. The first finding was um, um, regarded our auto tunes. Our man, it was just a discrepancy between our manual and what we did and what we said we did. Um, we were stating that we kept failed auto tunes as well and that was actually not the case um, they were not able to find any ones that had failed so um, that's easy enough to fix the second one um, the fact that um, we were not providing the calibration um, of our flask serial number so they cited us on um, they were not able to do an unbroken chain of calibrations so now we are going to be notating our calibrated flask serial numbers and we're also identifying our pipettes so that we can, um, we're labeling them so we're able to uh, identify them as we do analysis mm -hmm. and as we um, uh, make our solutions and that'll resolve that one. The third one that we found was um, the was was a bit a little bit more challenging and this is basically um, they want us to define what a routine panel is because um, we were actually doing what we call one off which is something that ABFT allows but we're not an ABFT lab basically saying that if um, this is something that you do not routinely quant. They were afraid that by us doing an analysis that it would affect the uncertainty of measurement for the analysis that we already did. So we're in the process of identifying all of the analysis that we routinely quant, all of the drugs that we routinely quant in talks, and um, one that'll provide a list to our customers as well. And we will then be able to um, not do any drugs that are not on that panel. Um, the fourth one, um, they had a problem with the fact that the procedure manual states that all positive results would be confirmed when not all positive screening results were being confirmed. Um, there were times that you'll find a drug in talks again um, where 
you can report it out as positive because you found it on more than one analysis, but we would not do a confirmatory analysis, a quantitation. And so we're in the process of um, just changing our manual to say, if as long as an in-house confirmatory method exists, we'll run it. And that'll help with that. Next to the last one was, um, again, the, the identification of pipettes and volumetric flasks, and also um, it that, that our manual does not document how sample dilutions are made or that um, how our calibration curve or controls. So basically somebody coming in would not be able to immediately reproduce everything that we did. Um, and it's just because we felt like this was kind of common sense that you'd be able to do the calculations, but they want it actually spelled out. So we're in the process of going through our manuals and making sure that our dilutions are spelled out, how to make a dilution, what you use, and also actually writing in what, how much you spike in order to make your calibration curves and controls. The final one that was found um, is um, we had some benzodiazepines that were run on two different methods. One was on LCMS MS and one was on GCMS MS. Actually, it's a, it's triple quad GC, and they would be found on both drugs. But we didn't have a written procedure on how those would be reported. So we're in the process of writing up a procedure on how those would be reported. So it was mostly just minor documentation issues that were found, mm -hmm. um, which are easily correctable, and we're in the process of getting those resolved um, okay. for for our accreditation body. Okay. Uh, I just want to take an opportunity here to say to you that um, OFS will receive additional emails and correspondence as well as supporting documentation for this. So this will again uh, be on an, an ongoing item and will be on the next meeting. But with that and, and Christine's uh, explanation, is there any questions for the lab? Pat? Hi, congratulations, by the way. Thank uh, you, Pat. And I've only got one question. So, and, 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 and I'm not giving any like advice as to how to fix or anything. It's just, it's, it's a question, but the in the in the situation where there is no SOP to go back to and 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 I I understand the whole um, frustration of saying you diluted something one to ten, but then having to say I took two microliters and twenty mi and eighteen microliters and so forth. I understand that, um, but is there any training records, any validation records, any verification records? that do state how sampling occurs because it doesn't have to be in an SOP. It could be in your training records where, you know, everybody in the chemistry department or toxicological department or toxicology department is sampling and so forth. So I was wondering if the, and I'm using the word sampling very broad. Um, sure. Did any of those sampling techniques exist anywhere else outside of your your general SOPs, possibly in QA, possibly in training and so forth? That's an excellent question and something I hadn't thought about. Um, as far as I know, and I would have to actually um, consult my my training personnel, um, that it's not specifically spelled out. It's something that we go over, but it's not something that we actually have written down. So um, we're still, going to be spelling out exactly how to do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And and once again, congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question on your sure. um, three of the uh, management breakdown. You do have a couple of uh, individuals listed as forensic consultants. Are they full time employees? No, they are not. There's somebody. Uh, well, one is actually he was our interim director before I was hired, um, so he was working full time um, at that time. He's gone back to working um, a lot of hours, but not full time. And then we have another forensic consultant who comes in 
to verify his matches. This is in firearms. Is that uh, McKellar and um, Mark Shaw? Yes. Those are your only two part timers or quasi. Correct. Okay. Now, is that adequate? Their their part time performance, or are you um, challenged in that area in terms of processing your work? Uh, actually, we're we're caught up in firearms. Mark has been able to keep us completely up to date on that. Um, we're still down two positions, and they are actually being hired. Um, we've actually gone through uh, interviews, and we have offers out, and they've been accepted, and they're starting mid December. And once the, they're both experienced individuals, one will be in firearms, one will be in controlled substances, and we're hoping that that will catch us up, um, especially in controlled substances, which is by far our biggest backlog. I see particularly Mr. Shaw um, spreads over a couple of the the um, department areas. Correct. Okay. So is there a full-time employee going to be substituting for Mr. Shaw or Shaw will remain and you're adding staff? Um, Mr. Shaw will remain. He will actually... Um, be the person who does the verifications of the firearms. Um, that's he'll go back to his other, what he used to do before he took on so many hours. Um, but we're bringing in a full-time firearms examiner and we're bringing in a full-time controlled substances uh, analyst. Um, we'll also have backups for controlled substances. We're, gonna, we're in the process of training in-house. Um, and so that will allow us to cross train the, the cross training will allow us to catch up that that casework. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Maria? Yes. Um, I'm referring to page 36.4 of for commissioners in the supplemental the late documents. Um, regarding the auto tune finding. The root cause said that. The failed auto tunes happen so infrequently and are so quickly resolved. The analyst did not think they had to be recorded, but the manual says results will be printed. So was it that the failed auto tune was printed, but then not recorded elsewhere, or was it also not printed? It was um, not printed. Okay. Or if it was, it was immediately discarded. Their concern was is that potentially somebody could come after the analyst and run on a failed auto tune. You know, even though we explained we're such a small lab that that theoretic, well, theoretically potentially could happen, it's in reality not going to happen because the person has the instrument for the day. Um, so, but you know, we're we're still working to comply and make sure that all our failed auto tunes are um, captured and recorded as well. And those failed um, or the information about the failed auto tune isn't stored somewhere on the instrument in the instrument software itself. Um, honestly, I don't know because I'm not familiar. They use a Shimatsu here and I'm not familiar with the software to whether they store it or not. Um, but that's I was just thinking question. if it was stored, they could, you know, if then it would be accessible. I don't know whether it's one of those things where it gets overwritten after a while. I, and I don't, I don't know. I know we've got some shimatsus here, shimatsus here as well, but I don't know the nitty gritty about what their software can and can't do. Right. Um, okay. So I was wondering about that. Um, let's see, another question for. And now I'm on, <clears throat> excuse me, page 36.12. And this is the HIPED calibrations and the control calculations. And it was, ob you said it, that you thought it was obvious. 
Sure. Healthy. So what do you mean by it was obvious? So what it what it stated is that um, it stated the concentration of what the um, working concentration was of the calibration material and you had to do a subsequent dilution of it in order to create your calibration curve and we felt like any competent analyst would be able to make those calculations without having it to be spelled out but they actually want it spelled out so we're just going through our sops and and putting that information in okay Then I'm going to page 36.14 for the commissioners. Um, with the, this is the one about the benzodiazepines analyzed on the GCMS, MS, LCMS, MS. Um, while the analyst has been consistently reporting the results, the SOP itself did not clearly state how these results were to be reported um so your, your your statement says while or maybe this was the inspector's statement while the analyst had been consistently reporting the results the sop itself didn't clearly state how they were to be reported so i guess how did the analyst know how to report the results if the sop didn't state how to do it she's just been um she's been in the the section for quite a while. And so she just knew based on her teachings on how to report them. Um, you know, the previous um, toxicologist taught her, so it was kind of passed down. So um, we're just going through and specifically stating all the circumstances and how to report it. So she just knew to average them um, if there were two values, but what they were concerned about is um, there was an instance of where one was um, above a reporting limit and one was less than the reporting limit and how to report that at that. So we're actually covering all the different scenarios and putting that into the SOP. So I guess that's probably following on what Pat was saying earlier, which is maybe this information might be in the training manual about how to do it, but maybe it's not in the actual SOP for performing the task as a, a trained analyst. Yeah, I think it was taught to her as she came on board, but it's not something that's specifically called out on this is what you do. Um, and so I don't think it's actually spelled out, um, written down. And so we're just, we're just covering our bases. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other questions? There are a couple other items regarding this laboratory. Um, um, actually, sorry, Jill, could I follow up or should I wait till the end or? No, go ahead. Uh, uh, as long, it's it's likely not involving the management changes or scope changes. So continue yeah, on. That's right. Fine. Okay, thank you. Um, it, just to follow up on uh, Lydia's uh, questions um, about the auto tune. Um, if I understand, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it is possible that um, a GCMS machine um, was run or, or GCMS was run on a machine that was not auto tuned. Is, is that possible? Uh, no, ma'am, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that um, there's a, they were afraid that somebody could come and run on a machine that had failed the auto tune. We, right. we actually run the auto tune every single time we analyze something. Um, that's just a standard protocol. Um, whereas the reality is, is if it fails the auto tune, we actually work on the machine until it passes. So that's not something that would ordinarily happen. Um, and actually it, it, um, a failed auto tune in drug, con drug, um, analysis is very, very infrequent. Mm -hmm. So um, when she even answered the question, she was thinking from a tox perspective, because right now my analyst covers both tox and controlled substances. Um, God bless her. She's an incredibly hard worker. Um, and so um, she's um, been working hard to, to get this. Pardon me, my, my phone just distracted me for a second. Um, so um, 
there is no chance that, that that we would absolutely run an auto tune every single time we go to analyze to answer your question. Okay. And, and I think this goes back to Lydia's question, but is there something in the machine itself that says eh, and locks when there's a failed auto tune, like some sort of flashing red light? Or it depends on the analyst saying, oh, got a got a wrong reading, fails, got a rerun. No, it actually states failed on it. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. and so that's how they know that it fails, but and they would rerun and fix what needs to be fixed in order to get it to pass. Um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't lock anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just basically mm -hmm. comes up, says, Hey, it didn't pass, you need to do additional work. Usually it's an, um, there's some air in the system. Um, and so you have to work to figure out where the leak is. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a standard reason that an auto tune might fail. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a general question, um, about disclosure, uh, in, in the documents we received, it did appear that some disclosures to, um, customers, uh, have been made C could you just describe the extent of disclosure of these of these nonconformities? um right now we're we're working on um providing to our customers the disclosures of what we do uh what our routine analysis are what our routine analytes are mm -hmm. um, um but that's pretty much the only one that i felt needed to be disclosed um we're certainly not well, hiding anything and we'd certainly be happy to turn anything over that, that yeah I, I i mean just two things a, a, do customers include the defense or the public even right i i, I mean uh, sometimes customers and i'm not saying you are but sometimes customers are interpreted as simply being the prosecution um but obviously they're people impacted uh by this um so i would just Say that this has to be turned over to the offense, right? These uh, defense that, right? These are nonconformities found um, by the accrediting agency that that needs to be disclosed. Correct. Right now, we have no methods for um, getting it to the defense. We would rely on the prosecution in order to um, disseminate that information with the discovery. Yeah, that seems to be a larger uh, issue um, throughout the state, actually. So you're not alone in that practice, but I, I, I do think that practice has to change, right? Because people are impacted by, by these issues. And, um, you know, I would think the lab has an imminent obligation to notify people impacted by it, but um, you, you're not alone in that. Um, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on, a um, couple of updates regarding the management changes, which we clearly know the end result. Uh, so September 30th, Mark Shaw was named the interim director upon the retirement of the interim director, um, Tom DeFonzo. And uh, Christine started as lab director on um, November 1st. She was announced and the org chart and CV was provided. Also, there was a scope change due to staffing changes. The laboratory requested the removal of fire debris and explosive analysis from its scope. Um, a and granted that change and updated their scope accordingly. Any questions regarding those? Uh, Jill, could I just ask one question? Sure, uh, Bill. It, it probably goes back to before, uh, if uh, Director Giffen could give us a time frame as to when these non-conformities are expected to be corrected. Oh, sure. We're, um, we've got about half of them already done. Um, we have to have them done by the beginning of January. Um, we're certainly not looking to wait that long, um, so probably within the next two weeks, we would have them all resolved. Uh, I know you're a new director, but just so you know, there's some urgency. Uh, this is a special audit that we requested based on some earlier nonconformities that uh, obviously predate your stewardship. So there's some urgency to this, and uh, I wish you the best in getting them uh, taken care of because if they're not by the next commission meeting, there's uh, there, there could be a problem. I certainly understand that, sir, and we will get them resolved as quickly as possible. Anyone else? Pat? Is fire debris gone for good or um, 
there are there plans to bring it back? We do have plans to bring it back. Um, we're not sure what the time frame is on that. Um, we would like to bring it back, though. Yeah, I understand. It's a tough one to keep running. It's it's hard to find people in Firebury. Okay, I just wasn't sure whether you didn't have the workload for it or whether you just didn't have the people for it. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along on the agenda. Next is the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Sciences. Um, a and &E conducted a surveillance document review on September 1st. The laboratory received no findings. Um, a and &E has a con uh, issued a continuation of accreditation letter and updated their certificate and scope document um, when prepared. So uh, congratulations to them. Uh, again, no findings and opening up for any questions to the laboratory. All right, hearing none, we'll move on. The Suffolk County Crime Lab is next. Um, first, we have um, an appointment of the quality manager, um, Inga Dorfman, on October 4th. Um, that became effective. Um, next is, uh, so just to draw attention to folks, um, the commission members, your meeting materials are split in this. There, there were about 900 pages of supporting documentation and email correspondence regarding their um, reaccreditation. So uh, just drawing that to your attention before we, we start the discussion on that. Um, at the September 17th meeting, the commission reviewed the laboratory's reaccreditation report that contained non uh, eight nonconformities. The laboratory submitted a corrective action plans for each of the finding and the objective evidence. They also received an extension to provide objective evidence for the crime scene nonconformity as the timing of crime scene is unpredictable. Um, due to the volume of the objective evidence, again, we have supplied that in a separate document. And um, I will open it up for any questions at this time. Perhaps it would be helpful to get them on the phone as well. So if they could just star three to raise their hand and we'll unmute you. Connie, you're on, you're unmuted. Connie, are you there? Are we now? Yes. I can hear you now. Good morning. Is it still morning? It's still morning. Okay. Um, I will ask the commission members, do we have any questions or comments for Connie? Well, I, I'd like to know if there's any disclosure to the customers, particularly with respect to the two level one uh, nonconformities, and what the nature of any disclosure is, particularly to the defense. Um, once we received our accreditation or the reassessment report after the uh, reassessment week, uh, Don Dole, the chief of the laboratory, contacted the prosecution and the DA's office and forwarded over the report to them. Once the level one corrective actions have been completely generated, they're uploaded to a box drive where they are accessible to the DA and the defense. It's difficult to hear the responses. Connie, if you could just get closer to the microphone, I think that might be helpful. Is that better? Slightly. All right, how about now? That's perfect. Thank you so much. That's good. Thank you. Could she repeat, please, what she said before? Sure. So once we receive the preliminary reassessment report, the chief of the laboratory forwarded it over to the DA's office. And then once all of the corrective action reports are, are completed, they're all in the monitoring phases, the level ones, they'll be uploaded to a box drive, which is accessible by the DA's office as well as the defense. Well, has that occurred since you are in the process of addressing these? I mean, is, is any of this in the box drive? At the present time, nope, they'll be uploaded probably within the next 2 weeks because the monitoring is still in progress. So, although. 
Um, and when did, it looks like it carries a September 17th date. Some of the, um, some of the other items date back to August. So none of them have yet migrated to you have been placed in your box drive for disclosure to the defense community. No, not yet, because we needed the plan to be approved in order to move forward with any corrective actions. So once the plan was approved, we move forward with the corrective actions and then we had to make whatever changes were necessary for those corrective actions. And then the monitoring takes place and then they'll be uploaded to the box. So there's at least now a three to four month delay between the critique and any disclosure that hasn't been disclosed as of yet. Just the initial reassessment report that said we had the finding. So is that in the box? Uh, is that in the, not at this time. No, just in the just the prosecution has it in their possession. The DA is all. <laughs> and what is the logic in in not making that available over a, you know, looks like it's four months on some of the. Uh, level two nonconformities. Well, the logic was that if the plan was not approved, we would have to adjust what we were doing. So we didn't know if the corrective action process would be completed at that point. And then typically all of our documents are uploaded quarterly because of the volume. So we would upload them in October, but they weren't completed yet. And then the next one would be the end of December. So it'll be in the next two weeks. So I don't, we don't typically put incomplete documents in the box. Well, to Ben's point, I would just add, I understand why if you're identifying a problem, you'd also want to provide uh, the solution, which will include how casework is done going forward, but you don't have to wait for the solution to disclose the problem and you shouldn't for, for you know, the reasons Ben is bringing up. I mean, time is of critical importance um, in the criminal justice system. Um, so I, I it, it, just a follow up question also about the box. What, what is the box? It, it's like a drop box. Is it controlled by the prosecution? And then the prosecution sends links during the discovery process. Do you know how that works or is the box publicly accessible or? It's not publicly accessible. As far as I understand, it's the first way you described it. The link is then distributed to the defense from the prosecution when the documents are uploaded. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Pat? Sorry, wrong mouse. Um, hey, Cons, I, I've got, I've just got a couple questions about some of the remediations. Um, the first one is the, the whole, and, and I'll use the example of, of T8, uh, not THC, TLC. Thin layer, uh, thin layer chromatography, where if there are isomers that can't be distinguished between the assay, um, generally, if you're not doing a confirmation on it, are you just, you're just going to indicate cocaine? Would you say possible cocaine lidocaine? Or are there any other pre-screening methods that you would use that would indicate that it is cocaine rather than cocaine lidocaine? Well, cocaine would be identified, but if there was an isomer that we could not identify on the GCMS, it would say indicated on the report. Okay, so this is not like you're running TLC and you're you're putting out a report that, and, and it's it's. And please don't be offended by the question. This is not you're getting TLC results and then saying okay, it, it's cocaine from the spot. Everything's being confirmed, but with the possibility of isomers, it might not be possible. That's correct. Okay, sorry. Um, the other question is, it's the uh, the the it's. Uh, I don't even want to say recommendation, but um, for the TLC plates, the photocopying, I I, I generally find that that's a, a poor representation, especially when you're replicating them for everybody on the outside world. Is there a reason why you still take that plate and just because I, I, I you know, it's like the P30 assay. Do you take pictures of your immunodiffusion strips so that 
the positives and negatives can be confirmed visually by the customer rather than just saying you looked at it and it's there. Like, why do you, there's a necessity to add the picture in that, or is there somewhere within limbs or on the manual worksheet that confirms what you saw? They are writing on the worksheet that they confirm what they confirmed when they looked at the plate, but it was recommended to us during this assessment that we include the photocopy. No kidding. That's one of my peeves. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't think you should put evidence on a photocopy, but that's okay. I'm not, a, I'm not a, an auditor. Um, lack, uh, the next question I have in the realm of, and I believe this was the training issue. The last training was in 2011. And the section was, and if you know before me, let me know because I've got a ah, trace, trace evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it, it sounds like lack of training, but the examiner must have had, had some previous experience, he or she. Did they pass internal competency tests and PT tests? Yes, I was the last analyst trained in the trace evidence section 11 years ago, and I passed all my <laughs> PT tests. Okay. So, but uh, going forward, there's obviously some type of methodology, but I, I, this one doesn't seem like you had any, any, uh, there's really nothing you can do here other than saying that you'll train whoever else comes in. Wow, 2011. And it was you? It was me. I didn't realize you can trace. I'm sorry. <laughs> you do a lot, um, don't you? If this was mostly just a documentation issue. Everything was, the standards were followed. The training was followed appropriately. We do have two new trace evidence analysts um, that just uh, went through the program. So we adjusted it as they went through and now it's written up appropriately and everything. Okay. Fine. Thank you. That, that you've, you've answered the question that I had trouble even asking. Thank you. <laughs> um, criteria covered for training. There it is. Competency testing. Uh, so the, the firearm issue of not putting the characteristics down on the sheet, but utilizing it and so forth. Um, do they, do they do their own self audits downstairs? Do you have another section do their self audit and then they confirm those? Like how did, um, how do you think that this went by for so long? I think. Based on when we do our internal audits, you can't have an auditor in the section that's being audited. Right. So when we did the internal audits and the internal auditors were asking, hey, how do you document this? It was verbally explained and they were satisfied. They followed the SOP. They could clearly see what they were looking for. So it wasn't something that we thought was missing. We had uh, notes written for the firearm section that said in and out, but now we've created these worksheets where it's very clear and you can tell exactly what they're looking at when they make an in and out. Um, so it was just kind of a lack of clarity on our interpretation or my interpretation of the standard and how it got addressed in the section. Okay, but but you in within the notes, did those characteristics get recorded within the 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 technical work, uh, not the worksheets in the notes? Now they do. They now weren't they clear. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't done prior, but now they do. Okay, right, thank correct. you. If I could jump back, are you, are you done, Pat? No, but go ahead, because it, it's I'm using my left arm. It's taking me time. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. The um, the report of the, or at least the calls that are made in terms of the matches, mm -hmm. um, are they reported, um, and are they in the box while this review is being undertaken? I mean. What matches are case you, to? you provided to the client, the district attorney's office, does it remain uh, available to prosecution and defense uh, without being paired with the criticism? What matches are you referring to? I'm sorry, I don't understand. It, any of the subject matter of the, the two level ones. You've done the casework, uh, you've analyzed the firearm uh you reported a match or an, a non or likelihood uh and now it's been criticized by the reviewer is the casework out there i'm sorry no we don't upload cases we just we just upload the corrective action paperwork so <clears throat> what I'm, okay i 
Well, yeah, the, the result, the, I'm sorry, the uh, cases that we do work on are uploaded to discovery, if that's what you're talking about. Okay, so is is yeah. that casework, it's in the discovery package that's pro yeah. provided, but the critique um, of the casework has not yet been uploaded. Correct. <coughs> so it's out there as though it is uncriticized casework. In terms of a defendant's counsel looking at the casework, there's no note that it's been the subject of criticism. Well, the, the prosecutors would disclose that. But the nature of the criticism you haven't even uploaded to the box for the prosecutor's benefit. Yes, that was disclosed. To the yeah, but the, yeah, the, the report, the reassessment report has been Given to, given, to been given. Yeah, file. she did say that it has yeah. been provided to prosecution outside of the box. So yeah. while it's not in the box, the prosecution does currently have it, have okay. the uh, assessment report. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Yeah. Judge, I, I think you had a question. That was Judge, I think you had a question. Yes, uh, my question is actually related, related to this box, and, and, and I think Mr. Uster covered it. But, so we're totally dependent on the prosecution having this information and communicating it to the defense. There's no independent way for the defense to access any of this information. Is, am I correct in understanding That's correct. that? They do have the opportunity to contact us at any time, though. We're happy to disclose if they need additional information. That's just the way the county had set up this discovery portal. Well, is that done as a matter of course? Or the, does do the defense attorneys contact you with respect to cases as a matter of course, or is it an exceptional thing? It's usually not often or typical. <clears throat> Thank you. How do I put my hand down? I guess I figured that out. Judge, I didn't even know you put electronically your hand up. I just saw you and recognized you on screen. I did. I did. I did. Oh, I okay. think it's that part. You don't have I'll to get put it your down. Hand up. We, I'll we, we, down. we uh, will recognize you, Judge, anytime you want to talk. Thank you. Pat is at it again. I'm, you got more, I'm sure. I'm Let's sorry. go. Sorry. Uh, and and it, it'll be quick, Constance. I'm sorry. So the, the other question now, Let's. I'm moving into the, the DNA section. Um, so the whole parent-child situation where extracts need to be treated as evidence and not a work product. Uh, how close are you guys to a limbs? In the process of generating a um, a DNA module with quarterly, it's in progress, and we're hoping to get it done in the next few months. The slow go, though. Okay, but so you you do have the barcoding portion, right? Not completed yet. Oh, uh, okay. Now, that was my question: was why don't you just use the 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 barcoding function and just configure it to say that extracts need to be transferred with some type of custody, but you, you're not even up to that yet. So, okay, no, that's the intent. Question, but you're moving in that in that in that direction. OK, yes. um, then the last the last thing is you're, you're probably going to say, oh, my goodness, I can't take them. Um, but on the <laughs> on page. It's all right. Everybody says that'll be at me at home. Um, this is page two of six on the same issue with the extracts if you look where it says customer notified it's marked x then crossed out but then no on the other side i just only because i teach to um you sh really should date and initial the cross out but that was just being kind of, i'm sorry it's hard for me to let those things go i think this denotes um did equipment performance maintenance? The, the answer was yes for equipment performance on the the DNA issue. And I'm assuming now it's because there really wasn't any equipment involved in that. This is uh, the DNA extract. So I'm understanding now why you mark yes for an equipment or a uh, equipment having an effect. Uh, is it is it because the, the chain of custody didn't work? It's just that you didn't have it. I think at that time it was for long term storage and we hadn't actually yet moved anything into long term storage. I see. Okay. All right. I was just a little confused as to why 11 was marked yes, because 
I didn't really see it as being equipment related, but that however you guys handle it is is how you handle it with the auditors. Um, and I think. Yeah, we marked it as a yes because of the beast situation. So we didn't oh, have the so module. You did, it, you did. Okay. All right. Then, then I, then my thought, my logic was the same. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. There is a vote required on this. Is there any other questions before we move on? Yeah, I, I have some questions, Jill. Um, just to ask you about the firearms tool marks findings, um, just to make sure I understand. Do, well, first of all, does does your lab um, make conclusions? It seems like it does based on the documentation provided um, of individual characteristics. So you're concluding, for instance, that two bullets were fired from the same gun or this bullet came from this gun. You are reporting on individual character, characteristics and identification. Is, is that right? Correct. Okay. And um, the findings, or at least one of them, related to um, the casework file didn't indicate if the uh, firearm analyst had actually identified features in the unknown sample, the evidence sample, prior to comparison with a known. Do, do I have that right? The, the typical practice was to look at the unknown and to identify the characteristics and then compare it to the known, but we didn't have that articulated in the notes. It, sorry, in the individual analyst notes, or you mean in the SOPs or both? Both. Okay. Um, and I, so one of the issues would be, I guess, if, if right, I hired some independent analyst to, to review the casework, they would not be able to figure out how your analysts reach the decision. Correct. What, okay. Are you reviewing um, old casework, right? I mean, there's that saying, right? If it's not documented, it didn't happen. So how do you, are you going back and, and reviewing old casework for firearm tool marks? If I could jump in, this is Don Dohler. I'm the chief of the lab. Um, the information for an identification was there. What was not put in the notes was that these characteristics were observed first prior to looking at the known. The comparison, all of the notes showing the comparison and the characteristics are present in the notes and could be followed by an independent person to see how they came to that conclusion. It just wasn't documented in the notes prior to looking at the known. So, so, Don, what you're saying is that it, the evaluation of the unknown was not clearly documented as first step prior to going to the known. That's correct. Yeah, I apologize. I confused the issue. <laughs> did did the SOP uh, indicate that um, characteristics were to be identified on the unknown prior to comparison? Did, did the SOP clearly state that? No, that was one of the things that we had to correct was to put that specific into the SOPs. And then we also included that, um, you know, in their note taking that that's clearly shown. It was practice. It just wasn't written in the SOPs. So it wasn't written in the SOPs and it wasn't documented in the individual cases. I, okay. Uh, question here. on that though. Is it part of your training that you do that when you train an analyst? Is that the the order in which you train the analyst, or is that not specifically outlined either? It's not specifically outlined in the training. <clears throat> is your lab considering perhaps sampling some of the older cases um, before you, you know, you're implementing these changes, um, sampling some of the cases and sending them to an independent expert for review? Because the yeah, concern, right, is who knows what happened? I mean, if it's not documented, it's not in training, it's not in your SOPs. It's not that it wasn't documented. The characteristics are clearly documented. The comparison is clearly documented. It's the uh, the steps. Mm -hmm. so you, we don't have proof within the, the analyst records that they looked at the queue and characterized all of the um, identifying features prior to looking at the known. 
but the end product, everything is there to show the comparison. It's been verified and all of that stuff has been followed. But the actual uh, stepwise, that was not clearly documented in the notes. This would seem though to, to affect, I think, um, the conclusions, right? Um, so your lab is not considering having any independent evaluation of the actual conclusions in um, old casework. We didn't, the assessors when they were on site didn't have any issues with our conclusions. It was just the documentation of the um, SOP and make sure that it was clear to the reader and to an external reader that you were evaluating the unknown before you evaluated the known. Okay, that's helpful to know. How many cases um, did the assessors look at? I, I know I saw paperwork for in your objective evidence, but we do you know how I many cases the assessors looked at before? I typically submit to them five cases per analyst, uh, reporting analyst. And then I think while she was in the section, she grabbed a couple more. So she was looking at easily 25, if not more than that. Mm -hmm. How many cases are run through the firearm tool marks unit just to get a sense of the volume? A year. Yeah, I would say upwards of 300 to 300. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I guess a larger question I have is I, I read through the documentation. Um, it was lengthy, but did the best I could. And I do see that um, there was paperwork uh, with the objective evidence, the case files after you instituted corrective actions, um, but also root cause analyses um, accompanied, obviously, each of each of these um, findings. What I didn't see, and I could have missed it, is even though root causes were done on each individual finding, I want to ask the lab if you've considered doing sort of a, I don't know what the phrase is really, but a meta root cause, right? Because the concern is, is there a lot of findings and there are some findings that transcend any one discipline. So this same finding is made, for instance, uh, and correct me if I get this wrong, but firearm tool marks and trace maybe, um, so that different disciplines are sharing the same findings and there are a lot of findings. That would seem to suggest the need for sort of a meta root cause, like what's going on, right? This this is concerning. Um, is Has your lab or is your lab in the process of, of looking at this? Why, why is this happening? Yes, actually, the, the, the number one priority in 2022 is to go through each of the eight um, findings and ensure that every section, the six main disciplines within the lab are in conformance with how the finding was written up and how we performed the corrective action. Right. Yeah, no, I, I guess my my concern is looking at those in isolation because they're not in isolation, right? There's, they're, like I'm saying, like several disciplines share the same problem and there are a lot of nonconformities. So that means there's a larger problem. How, how is that being addressed? So what we did was, well, what we will be doing is we're going to look at the findings as a whole, sit down and evaluate how those um, standards were addressed in each section and make a unified uh, process for addressing those findings and then moving manual by manual to ensure that everyone is consistent. It's consistent. Uh, as it can be. And okay. I'd also add to that that uh, we just recently hired Inga Dorfman, who is our new quality manager, and this is one of the priorities that I've given her to go through each section and through each manual to make sure that uh, conform uh, non conformity found in one section is being covered in another section, even though they weren't highlighted during the recent assessment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, is this being done as like a root cause? Will it be provided to the commission, um, to ANAB, and really to the public, to um, or at the very least of the defense and prosecution, this sort of meta root cause? It's not something we uh, specifically thought about, to be honest with you, but it's not something we're opposed to. This is something that we know and we're addressing. So to provide that information is not really an issue. And I also note too that this will, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be again on the agenda. So. Mm -hmm. um, 
we may get updates at that time. Um, did you have any other questions? I don't think so. Thanks, Joe. Okay. So the laboratory's accreditation is set to expire December 31st of this year. Um, due to timing, um, in order for the DNA subcommittee to review the final nonconformity resolution documentation and issue a binding recommendation to the commission, uh, an extension of the New York State accreditation will be required. So we'll need to take a vote on this. Do I have a motion to issue an extension to the New York State accreditation of the Suffolk County Crime Laboratory to March 4th, 2022, which is our next meeting? I think the judge was making a motion, but she's muted. Well, no, I was going to ask you the, how long we were extending it, but you answered that. Yes. Okay. So um, do I have a motion? Okay, I'll move it. I'll move it. Okay. Judge has made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Lydia has second. When I call on you, please state your vote for the record. My vote is yes. Commissioner Rosado? Yes. Pat? Yes. Lydia? Yes. Bill? Yes. Jessica? No. Judge? Yes. Mike? Yes. Ben? I'm sorry, Ben, I think you're muted. Yes. <laughs> no. Ben says no. Um, Superintendent? Yes. And Ann? Yes. Thank you. Uh, with that, I believe the motion carries. So next on the agenda, moving on, uh, is the old business. Uh, I will provide an update regarding our familial search statistics. Since our last meeting, um, we currently are at 51 total applications that have been submitted to the program with eight resubmissions and two renewals. So that makes 41 unique applications. Of those, 35 have been approved, 13 rejected, two withdrawn, and one in process. Of the 35 approved, we have 10 in queue or in process, and 25 have been completed. Do we have any questions? Moving on to the next item. Um, this was discussed um, uh, last meeting, accreditation standards. As we discussed in the September 17th meeting, um, our office has provided the proposed changes to add some language, including the ISO 17020 standard as additional accreditation options for those particularly of the comparative disciplines, such as latent analysis. Um, you do have that in your documentation. Do we have any discussion regarding that? I, I would just ask, I guess, is 17025 also being considered or? So 17025 it... would still remain. That okay. would still remain as it is. Um, that's primarily those um, analytical uh, instrumentation based disciplines, whereas uh, 17020 is more of an option for those of like the latent print comparative sciences. Just so I understand, so 17025 wouldn't apply to latent print analysis that would? No, it could. It could. Okay. However, the criteria as it's stated uh, for accreditations, most of, um, not most, some of them would be not applicable. So mm -hmm. it, it, the latent print folks would have the option to pursue either 17025, such as the DCGS Latent Print Lab, who is ISO 17025 accredited, or they could pursue 17020 as an option, as long as they're accredited. That is the goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As just in terms of commission responsibility, do what role do we have? Are we can we require that um, they conform to 17020 or? Uh, I don't think that we would have that ability to have the requirement of one versus the other, but they would have the option for both. Okay. As it's laid out in the uh, in the edited version that we've given you. Right. Right. 
I think we we talked about the the distinction between the two options at the last commission meeting, and I don't think you were present for that one, Jessica. So I thought it was pretty right. Didn't we? Didn't um, a substitute? I, no, no, no was, she was, I was present. I was, present. was not present. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, th I thought that we did talk about the distinction and why we, you know, why we were going to, um, why it was understandable maybe that 17020 would be more appropriate for want of a better term just because uh, it would be an answer for not applicable for so many, I guess, for certain aspects of 17025. Okay, so I, that's, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, that, uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it's the difference between the two standards. Uh, despite our, our, the last meeting, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around. Um, so this is, for, uh, okay, Pat, sorry, just saw you. I don't know, I don't know if it needs to, because I don't, I'm not a legal person, but do you think we need to include the AR in the statement or is it just, enough to suffice that we're saying 17025 which requires the AR. I don't believe we specify the AR in 17025. So the additional requirements. I, it was just a suggestion. I don't know if it has to be in there, but there is another document that's required for accreditation. It, so the the 17025 obviously is the 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 requirements that were made long ago and the AR is kind of molded it towards forensic science. So um, so, not sure if you want to look into it before it goes forward. Jill, I think the language was was says something to the effect of um, the A and AB program, and that would incorporate because they're at, uh, prone to changing their documentation titles and names, Pat. And we were, you know, a little remiss to include that in case they did that to us again. We can't change the regs, you know, every as often as they change their documentation. We try okay. To. So I think we tried to incorporate language to that effect in in there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Natasha, do we need a vote to move forward with submitting this or is this something that we can just um, proceed with? This is going to the DNA subcommittee, right? No. This is for this is this us. It's just us. Okay, then I would vote on it, yes. Okay. So with that, then I will um, make a motion to move forward with the proposed changes to the um uh NYCRR 6190.17, specifically the A and E B definition as proposed in our documents, and submit that in order to allow um, ISO 17020 to be an option for accreditation. Do I have a motion? No move. Sure. Uh, and do I have a second? Second. Okay, I'll go through and I will um, take a vote for the record. My vote is yes. Commissioner? It would appear she may be having some connection issues, so we will come back to her. Um, Pat? In favor. Lydia? Yes. Bill? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Um, Judge? Yes. Um, where did I leave off? Mike? Yes. Ben? Yes. Superintendent? Yes. And Anne? Yes. And we'll see if uh, the commissioner is able to connect and give a vote. Uh, looks like we just might have lost her. So she is not present for the vote. But even with that, the motion carries. Um, next on the agenda, we have um, investigative genetic genealogy. 
Um, as you remember from the last meeting, the commission requested that a letter be sent to NYPD inviting them to give a detailed description of their use of gen investigative genetic genealogy. I believe we do have a representative on the call with us if they could star three so we can unmute you. I believe it's Chief Katranakis. Call in user 25, Elizabeth. And I believe they're unmuted. Hello, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well. This is so, Manny Katranakis, Deputy Chief Manny Katranakis. Good morning, so I will leave this open. Uh, what the commission was looking for is to get an idea of how the investigative genetic genealogy process is working within the NYPD. Um, I'm not sure if we should just open it for questions to the commission members or if we would like to have um, Deputy Chief speak first. Anyone have any thoughts? So my recommendation is that we present uh, several things that we'd like to uh, inform the commission of. First, okay. because many of the questions that may be raised could be answered with our statement. Perfect. I'll open the floor to you then. Feel free. Great. So, so let me just also uh, allow uh, another member of the NYPD to introduce himself who's going to be part of this with me. Hi, this is uh, Executive Director Bob Barrows. I'm from the NYPD's Legal Bureau and I'm here with the Chief today. Great. So, good morning, Chairwoman Rosado, members of the Commission. I'm Deputy Chief Emmanuel Katronakis. I'm the commanding officer of the NYPD's Forensic Investigations Division. And on behalf of the NYPD, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. So as the largest police department in the United States, the NYPD prides itself on serving and protecting the public. So as requested by the commission, our aim today is to present a detailed description of the NYPD's application of investigative genealogy as well as plans for future use in order to assist the Commission in assessing its jurisdiction in this area. I'll be happy to answer any of these questions that you have at the conclusion of my statement. So investigative genealogy has proven to be a great value in law enforcement investigations. Of course, the United States genealogy is solving unsolved crimes that have gone decades without new leads or information often leaving victims or their families longing for answers. Investigative genealogy can bring truth, closure, and resolution through unbiased science by uncovering leads that would not be obtained through any other investigative techniques. Since the New York State Department of Health initially announced the approved use of investigative genealogy in 2020, the NYPD has applied investigative genealogy unsolved cases through the New York State Department of Health certified laboratory systems, namely Bodhi and Parabon. The certified laboratory systems perform the full suite of investigative genetic genealogy services. The NYPD has also partnered with federal law enforcement agencies to apply investigative genealogy to unsolved cases. It should be noted, however, that when it comes to using the New York State Department of Health certified laboratories, the cost can be understandably prohibitive, even for agencies as large as the NYPD. It has been our experience that the use of DOA certified systems range from five to $10,000 for a single request, a cost that many local New York State law enforcement agencies would be unable to absorb, even with a handful of cases. The NYPD is exploring the following investigative genealogy model when it comes to cases where we do not partner with a federal law enforcement agency. So the first is we do currently evaluate the case for an initial determination as to whether the investigative genealogy should be applied. If so, the NYPD will request testing be performed only by a New York State Department of Health Certified Laboratory System. The NYPD will request the bioinformatics be performed 
only by a New York State DOH certified laboratory system. And consequently, trained NYPD personnel will perform the genealogical investigations. So with that said, I'd like to walk you through this in detail as it applies to crime scene evidence. The first part of the model is the internal evaluation of the case. The NYPD will only authorize the use of investigative genealogy if the case satisfies both investigative and technical requirements and after conferral with the respective prosecutor's office. To satisfy an investigative review, the case must, for one, be unsolved with all reasonable investigative leads pursued, including a negative CODIS search. Number two, be an investigation of a violent crime, such as a homicide, sexual assault, or other violent crime. And three, a probative value assessment of the DNA evidence must occur. Let me talk to you about the probative value assessment in some detail. So the probative value assessment considers the location of the DNA evidence in the crime scene, the type of biological evidence, the type of substrate the DNA evidence is deposited thereon, and the rational inference that the perpetrator is the likely source of the DNA evidence. The technical requirements consist of sample testing result requirements established by the New York State Department of Health certified laboratories that are applied to the initial PCR-STR DNA data that is conducted and generated by the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner's Forensic Biology Laboratory. In other words, the DNA laboratory. Specifically, the volume of the sample extract remaining, the quantitative value of extract, in other words, the concentration, and the degradation index. The NYPD would simply be communicating OCME information to the New York State Department of Health certified laboratory systems. So I want to be clear, the NYPD is not planning to develop the capability to perform SNP testing, nor does the NYPD have any plans to perform SNP profile interpretation, mixture analysis, mixture interpretation, mixture deconvolution, or statistical calculations. When a case satisfies the investigative and technical requirements, as I described, and the NYPD does not partner with a federal law enforcement agency, then the NYPD will submit the DNA sample to a New York State Department of Health certified laboratory system to produce a single nucleotide polymorphism profile, otherwise known as a SNP profile. Once a SNP profile is generated by the New York State Department of Health certified laboratory, the bioinformatics portion of the investigative genealogy will be completed by the New York State Department of Health Certified Laboratory System. Again, the NYPD will not and is not seeking to perform any bioinformatics steps or assume any scientific responsibilities associated with laboratory analysis. When the SNP profile is tested and formatted, the New York State Department of Health Certified Laboratory will electronically transfer the SNP profile to a designated supervisor in the NYPD. The supervisor will be the sole recipient and is responsible for security and the access of the SNP profile. The NYPD would then assume the non-laboratory based investigative genealogy work and search the SNP profile through publicly available genealogical databases. This search is analogous to other publicly available searches investigators in the NYPD routinely perform in the normal course of their work. Currently, there are two publicly available genealogical databases that allow law enforcement to search their databases for investigative purposes, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA are commonly searched by law enforcement throughout the United States, and specifically are the databases that the New York State Department of Health certified laboratories currently use to conduct genealogical investigations. 
GEDmatch is a database that allows the public to voluntarily upload DNA SNP profiles to find potential genetic relatives. Prior to upload, GEDmatch requires users to decide if they want to opt in or opt out. When a user opts in to GEDmatch, the user agrees that their profile will be, as stated on the website, compared with kits submitted by law enforcement to identify perpetrators of violent crimes. The Family Tree DNA website reads, you understand that depending on your settings, your information may be compared with genetic information submitted by law enforcement accounts to assist in the identification of deceased individuals or the identification of possible suspects of crimes involving homicides, sexual assaults, or child abduction, violent crimes. As part of the NYPD's model, the commanding officer of the Forensic Investigations Division will be directly responsible for and oversee the genealogy investigation. A small number of trained NYPD personnel assigned to the Forensic Investigation Division will perform the SNP profile search using GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA databases. The NYPD laboratory personnel will not perform any part of the investigative genealogy work. The NYPD personnel performing the investigative genealogy work will not be physically situated in the police laboratory. These individuals performing the investigative genealogy will not report to laboratory management. So at the risk of sounding redundant, I want to be very clear, personnel assigned to the NYPD's police laboratory will not perform any task in part or in whole associated with investigative genealogy. Once the SNP profile is searched, investigators will build one or more family trees for the purposes of establishing ancestral lines and relationships of genetic relatives. The family tree building investigative step is extremely similar to the NYPD's existing familial DNA hit investigative model. The vast majority of persons listed in the family tree will be excluded using law enforcement and open source record searches. Individuals can be excluded based on a variety of factors, such as having DNA on file in CODIS, deceased at the time and the date of the crime, or the inability to commit the crime based on the individual being incarcerated at the time the crime was committed, etc. So once authorized by myself, the commanding officer of the Forensic Investigations Division, the case detective would initiate the collection of DNA suspect exemplars from persons as the geneal genealogy investigation dictates. Investigators would then submit and await the PCR or STR comparison results from the OCME DNA laboratory. Specifically, the comparison of the crime scene DNA profile to the suspect DNA exemplar profile. The OCME will report an exclusion or a DNA match. If a DNA match is reported, the investigators will employ traditional investigative methods utilized in a direct DNA match. So in closing, we are grateful for the opportunity to provide this detailed description today. We appreciate the forward-looking approach that the Commission has employed when it comes to investigative genealogy. And as the Department further explores its application, it will do so responsibly and transparently. So I want to thank you for your attention and your time, and now I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Jill, uh, may I ask a question? We lost Jill, um, so I'm going to say yes, you can go ahead. That's okay. Hey, Nanny, this is Bill Fitzpatrick. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Uh, two, two quick questions, Manny. You said that uh, you'll, you'll run the sample initially through CODIS. 
and you, you won't go to this process un, unless you get a negative result. Do you, not that it's crucial, but do you, if, if CODIS comes up empty, do you do familial searching before you do the SNP analysis? So that, that's a question that we've explored uh, in, in several instances. And um, we, we won't uh, particularly uh, look to follow a specific sequence on familial DNA searching as being the first step in the process and then investigative genetic genealogy is the second. Uh, generally speaking, we would perform familial DNA searching first. However, the turnaround time for the familial DNA searching result is upwards of nine months uh, to a year. So that, that factor is taken into consideration in our decision-making process. In contrast to investigative genetic genealogy, where the turnaround time for a result is, is significantly less than nine months to a year. Got it. Um, so your role is relatively ministerial, and it, uh, when, you, when you get some type of results of the family tree, at that point, you turn it over to the Detective Bureau whoever the case agent is handling the matter? So in-house, uh, we, we, the answer is yes. Uh, in essence, the answer is yes. However, uh, upfront family trees are established here inside our Forensic Investigations Division with our detectives. So our command, the Forensic Investigations Division, is part of the NYPD's Detective Bureau and we would conduct an initial investigation as far as building a family tree, performing the record searches, and then at, at some point, based on my discretion, we would bring in the investigative command that initially had that case and pursue the investigation from that point. Got it. Uh, two last questions. I, I've seen technology from Parabon where they will take a DNA sample and they'll actually uh, generate a sketch of the suspect. Are you using that technology at all? So there may be an instant that we would we would request that Paravon do provide their uh, snapshot suite. Um, that's that's essentially it. Um, okay. The I'm right. just, just curious. And, and, I, you know, as far as far as from an investigative perspective, I mean, it is precisely that, right? It's this generated yep. image um, that that's provided, but it, it's not the wherewithal to solve the case. Um, it's certainly not used as a means of an identification. So that that's something I want to be very clear on. Um, yep. We we yep. we are, you know, in, in this particular matter when it comes to investigative genealogy, which may be self-evident to many, and and forgive me if I'm being uh, repetitive, but it's it's really the the accredited laboratories PCR comparison result that is is the is the closure of an identification in a case like this or okay. in, in investigative okay. genealogy. Uh, last last question, Manny. Uh, have you had any success or is it too early to say? So I could tell you uh, we've had a success but that's as far as I can uh, uh, talk about it. Understood. Okay. And Thanks, Manny. Bill, whether or not the Parabon can use its phenotypic markers for its snapshot is a matter for the Department of Health to approve in their lab accreditation. And I don't believe that's yet been approved by DOH. So the SNP profile parabond searches, yes, but the SNPs that are the phenotypic um, ones phenotypically related, not yet. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I, I have some questions. Um, Good afternoon. So just to make sure I understand this process right, um, you described an initial stage where a case is reviewed internally um, by the NYPD for suitability 
to even do IgG is investigative genetic genealogy. Is is that right? I'm sorry. Can can you repeat that? Sure. Um, you described an initial internal stage um, where the NYPD decides whether you're even going to go forward and use IgG. That's correct. Okay. Who who is doing this review? I am. I am with the team team of individuals assigned to forensic investigations. Who are the team of individuals? I'm not, I'm not understanding what your question is. So the forensic so, so investigation my command is, is Go ahead. Consists of the uh Forensic Investigations Division, the Crime Scene Unit, the Laboratory, the Latent Print Section is is the is the command. So on, under the Forensic Investigations Division are a small number of people that are not assigned to any of the three units I mentioned. They work specifically on cases involving familial DNA searching, investigative genetic genealogy. Those are the folks. Okay. And. Your criteria that you described is that it's unsolved negative code code of search, and you mentioned a requirement of violent crime. Does that include um, simple gun possession? No, it does not. So the NYPD has not, uh, nor will, if if this practice continues, use IgG on. Uh, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree or just simple gun possession. And so is your question, are we going to apply investigative genealogy to criminal possession of a weapon case? Yep. That's no, my question. No, we will not. Okay. What about burglaries? No, we will not use them on burglaries. I just uh, ask a question, jump in here real quick, is that I, I thought he made mention too of the public databases that are being used, GEDmatch and Family Tree, having specific outlines of what law enforcement could and could not use them for, which was part of their opt-in for their customers, correct? Am I right on that, Manny? You did say that it had to be... Um, yeah. You're, you're in fact correct, and and you know, generally speaking, the the whole point of of the cost behind this and the uh, amount of labor that goes into the application of investigative genealogy um, is is extensive, and you know I'm not I'm not certain how many individuals have been involved with cases like this or investigations, but they are very, very labor intensive. And from my perspective, this is an investment on my part. So the investment has to come with some type of dividend on the back end that can be significant when it comes to justice and finding the truth using science. So in, in my years working on familial DNA searching and investigative genealogy, we're only working on homicides, sexual assaults, and the most serious of violent crimes. So that's just from a generic perspective. So I, I, I would ask you to take a look at the familial DNA searching regulations. They, they have a clear outline, which generally depicts the, the regulations surrounding what I've just described from a fundamental philosophical perspective. Um, also what I had just read, also, what you what you read from GEDmatch and Parabon and uh, Family Tree DNA, as far as their websites are concerned. So, so clearly, the you know the the momentum behind using investigative genetic genealogy is is in the most serious crimes and the most violent crimes. So just to be clear about exactly what NYPD is doing, um, there, you send it, uh, there's gonna be a DOH certified wet lab that produces um, the SNP profile. Then it is sent to Parabon uh, or Bodhi, uh, DOH certified. Um, but 
but then right it's given back to members of the NYPD. So the NYPD will be in possession of people's uh, or this this SNP profile. Is is that right? And actually do the uploading into GEDmatch or Family Tree. That's correct. Yes. Okay. And then the results um, come back. They could you could hit to somebody in one of these databases, presumably, right? Or you could get one of these close associations like familial, um, and then you start building out uh, your family tree. So it's NYPD personnel who are analyzing the results of the SNP search in GEDmatch and Family Tree. So before I answer the question, I, I, I just want to exercise a little caution in some of those terms in the nomenclature sure. that you use in, in your question, sure. right? Sure. So when you're conducting a, uh, a SNP profile search, results are not hits, right? So hits are commonly used in CODIS laboratories when it comes to an STR match, right? So there's a very, very important distinction between an accredited laboratories PCR STR work and searching a SNP profile in GEDmatch or family tree. Uh, so that, 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 right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not a hit. Results that, rece that are received by these searches are not hits, right? So these are associations based on some measure of sharing in DNA. And quite often the term is leads that are used. But this is information that's being provided back that we will investigate. You use the term analysis, that's fine if you use that term. The only thing I would say to exercise some caution with is it's not associated with laboratory analysis. It's investigative work. It's detective, police, investigative work where we are looking at information provided to us from these searches. And would some of that analysis include an NYPD uh, detective figuring out how close the associations are um, based on the results of the GED match or family tree search, if that makes sense, right? Like figuring out, okay, we have X number of centimorgans. Sorry, I'm just turning this out, right? So therefore we think it's this degree of relatedness and now we're gonna start to piece together our family tree. So certainly the centimorgan values are considered amongst the totality of facts and circumstances but that's one single piece of information amongst the totality of information surrounding information provided as a result of a SNP profile search. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, the answer is yes, but what, what, what I just wanna be very clear in a sense of that's, that's just one dimension among many dimensions in the investigative process. Mike, I think you, Mike, uh, just wrote real quick, I think Mike may have wanted to interject something. Oh, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first, that was a very um, thorough description. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to know, what is the output? So when these profiles are searched in GEDmatch, what is the output that you uh, get back? Okay. So when we search a profile, and, and I, I think it's just important to note that Par Paravon and Bodhi, right, as the two state Department of Health certified entities, would provide these same names and information to us, similar to the way we would be doing this, right? So when the search is conducted, there are results that are provided from both GEDmatch and Family Tree. And those results are in the form of a quantity of DNA shared, which is a centimorgan value, and then names that are associated with, with those values. So there could be instances where no one in those two databases I mentioned, GEDmatch and Family Tree, uh, have a close relationship uh, to the degree that would warrant further investigation, meaning there could be a potential negative result so, you know, various agencies and various genealogists, investigative genealogists will have different thresholds on when they'll continue to pursue. It's, it, again, as I pointed out, there's a very, very significant investment in these cases as far as time is concerned, investigative time. Um, 
and it could take hundreds, if not thousands of hours and years in, in some of these cases when you have relatives that are extremely far off from, from the individual that you're looking to identify. So there are thresholds that are involved. We would receive certain names and they would have a Santa Morgan value, which would show the potential degree or magnitude of DNA being shared. So uh, really this is less of an analysis, right? Because you're generating investigative leads and you're just trying to prioritize. Is that fair to say? I, I think that, that puts it very succinctly and, and precisely what it is. Thanks very much. Jill? Yep. Anne? Um, so in what you just said, you're substituting your personnel um, for doing the SNP profile that you're getting from a certified Department of Health lab um, to the two public databases, correct? I'm not certain what you mean by substitute. So could you be, getting, uh, could you be understand what's being substituted? Well, you're doing what or Brody are doing now, correct? And let me, let me just jump in and say, I think what is happening is that the SNP profile that would be entered into these public databases is what's being provided to NYPD, just as if you were to get a SNP profile as a home consumer and put that into the same public database. Understood, but he's, he's, you're no longer using the services of Parabond or Brody, correct? No, I'm not saying that. You're I'm not saying that. The SNP profile is going to come from the certified SNP lab, the DOH approved lab. It's going to go to Parabond or Brody and then come so, to so, so our our plan is to have Parabond and Brody perform the analysis, generate the SNP profile, format the SNP profile to make it ready to search Jed match and family tree and then provide it to us. Now, yep. let me just take let me take a step back for a second. So, none of this is absolute in a sense of we have options on the table. I may decide in a certain case to have Parabon or Bodhi perform the full suite of investigative work when it comes to genealogy. Or I may choose to have the genealogy investigation conducted in-house, right? So the question is, do we outsource our detective work or do we perform the detective work in-house in the NYPD? And okay. I think both options are on the table. And as I mentioned earlier in my statement, cost plays a role, funding plays a role, the number of cases that we're managing will play a role. There are a whole series of factors that go into these decisions, but it, it's not an all or none as far as our program moving forward and what our plans are moving forward. Um, if I could just make one mention to a question that came up earlier to shed some light on it uh, as it pertains to the phenotyping uh, that I believe was brought up by uh, Dr. Wiley. Um, so I understand that there uh, is uh, some approval from the Department of Health as far as the um, phenotyping. So there's a communication that I'm aware of between the State Department of Health and Parabon um, that offers the testing in the amended permit to include data analysis, phenotyping, and ancestry and kinship and genetic genealogy. So that, that's just something I want to bring to the commission's attention where I understand that phenotyping is approved by the Department of Health to be provided as a service by Parabon. The, the phenotyping that's approved by the Department of Health, and there is a, a piece, but it is very much linked to specific markers so it isn't their full profile. Just, you know, yes and no. I mean, you know, and it will change over time. 
as Paravon submits additional validation document for additional markers, but it is marker specific. Um, just, uh, but let's go back to my other question about involving Parabond or not involving Parabond. Parabond doesn't do SNP profiles. That's done by a precursor laboratory that submits the SNP profile to Parabond, who then does the genealogical comparisons and preparations. So the question was going to be, in those cases where you decide for a variety of reasons, including cost, that you're going to bypass the services of Parabond and you're going to get the SNP profiles directly and use your personnel to do the analysis and the searching on the public databases. Why doesn't the NYPD investigative unit require either a New York State Department of Health laboratory permit as a genealogical lab, uh, investigative lab like Parabond and Brody, or a forensic lab permit from DCJS if the appropriate standards um, were established. Why don't you need to be certified as a lab when you do it yourself? Well, because the the assertions in your question are incorrect and categorically false. So your first the first point of the uh, NYPD going around a state DOH certified paired laboratory system. So we are not going to go around Parabon or Bodhi to the direct. SNP profile testing laboratory. And that is why I used in my statement the specific term systems. So the system from my recollection and my understanding as explanations were provided in previous commission statements were that Parabon works together with a testing yes. laboratory to perform the SNP work. That's true. Similar to Bodhi. That's true. The That's NYPD true. is only going to coordinate this work with Parabon or Bodhi. Okay. That's I misunderstood then. Any other questions? Yes, I have a couple of follow up. Um, so NYPD will be in possession of SNP profiles. What are you going to do with the SNP profiles after you upload and search them? What happens to those profiles after? We would secure them as we do all other evidence and confidential information. Sorry, what, what does that mean? You, you would put them in a file and keep them at the NYPD? What does that mean? So it's, it's, it's electronic evidence and we would secure that electronic evidence and follow our procedures of all electronic evidence under our Information Technology Bureau's platform and infrastructure. Do you have a retention policy for this stuff or you're saying we're always going to, we're always going to keep these profiles? Yeah, so so let, let me give you a, a quick analogy, a, a simple one. So a crime scene detective takes a crime scene photograph at a scene, mm -hmm. and it is a digital mm -hmm. photograph, and we retain that photograph indefinitely. The SNP profile will follow the same exact route as far as security, preservation, as electronic evidence. Yeah. The so problem is, is there sense. are a lot of... Uh, Privacy concerns with genetic data that aren't present with a photograph of a crime scene. No, but they're both confidential and the NYPD and the forensic investigations division is dealing every day with thousands and thousands of confidential laboratory reports, crime scene investigative case files and reports and photographs, latent print examinations, and then the list goes on and on and on. 
So the confidentiality surrounding this is akin to the same confidentiality behind every item of evidence that's submitted to our laboratory, every latent fingerprint lift that's submitted to our latent print section, every item of evidence among the 100,000 items of evidence that are submitted to the laboratory on any given day, in addition to the photographs as I described and the many, many other pieces of evidence and information that comes across investigators in the Forensic Investigations Division. I would just say this is PD legal that, you know, this, this is going to be used in a handful of cases that we're not talking about. You know, this is, this is something that, you know, is generating a lot of data, a lot of information. We do have retention periods when it comes to uh, custody of certain records, evidence. I'm happy to follow up with the commission and provide those uh, uh, afterwards. Will these, thank you, that would be helpful. Uh, will these SNP profiles be kept in a database that's searchable? Sorry, I'm not referring to GEDmatch or family tree. I'm referring to in-house at the NYPD. Absolutely not, no. Um, and another question relating to the point of the investigation where your detectives um, are going out and doing investigative work. Uh, will you be collecting no non-suspect samples in an effort to say build out your family tree or in the course of investigation? So you said no non-suspect. I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. I wasn't... Sorry. Uh, yeah, the connection's a little uh, rough. Known non-suspect. Known, not no. <laughs> known non-suspect. So you're talking about individuals that we feel are not suspects, mm -hmm. but are present in the genealogy investigation. Is that is that correct? correct? Yes. So that would be a case by case dependent uh, question and a hypothetical question. And investigative genealogists throughout the United States of America, it, it depends on where that investigation is. It depends on the family tree. It depends on the facts and circumstances of this individual. So it, it, it's, it's a question which I, I can't answer definitively it would depend on the case. Okay. If um, the case in your judgment uh, called for that step, would you seek a warrant to get the known non-suspects uh, DNA or would your detectives collect it so maliciously? So uh, I'm not sure how this is relevant to the commission's purpose today and the aim of my presentation talking about the granular elements on how the NYPD conducts its criminal investigations and follow up to an investigative genealogy. Really my aim today was to talk to you about the investigative genealogy process and not collecting DNA from persons. So I'd like to move forward because I don't see this as being relevant to investigative genealogy. It's relevant because it's part of the investigative genetic genealogy process that you're engaged in and implicates uh, many, many people's rights, genetic privacy, et cetera. So it's part and parcel of the very process that you intend to engage in. I certainly appreciate the question. I think, I think in answering this, our collection of DNA is guided by what the laws permit and what the case law permits. And I would also just mention uh, as as the chief has noted in his statement this is also an effort that we work with the district attorneys on and we we confer with them and we try to figure out what is the best way to get to the outcome um, that's necessary so again we take a look at the laws we take a look at what case law has said about dna collection and we're guided by that would, would you seek civil rights law section 79l compliant consent from these identified individuals? I think we would since, consider all relevant laws. Since and, the and, SNP, and, and, well, well, the SNP lab doing the testing under DOH permit has to have certification that any individual tested, particularly if you're gonna use phenotypic markers, has given their consent to the testing to be done. Your alternative is a court order.
I'm, I'm not sure. Is that a question or a statement or are you expecting a response? The question was, do you intend to use civil rights law 79L compliant consent documents? I think we consult all, obviously, I think we consult all relevant laws and case law when it comes to the collection of DNA. Okay. I'd love to see your sample consent form. Sure. Any any requests you have for anything from us, uh, we're happy to uh, to consider. Uh, we just ask that you submit them in writing. Has this proposal been submitted to the DNA subcommittee, or is it your intent to do so? It, it's currently not my intent. But do you have a recommendation? Well, I think the commission has to consider that question. I don't know. It is DNA testing and the DNA subcommittee has binding authority to tell us what we can and can't do. I would interject though that it's over uh, public forensic laboratories and I would defer to Natasha for. Oh, sorry, I'm on, on mute. <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to talk. I'm on mute. Um, you know, the, the point of them coming today was to provide additional information so that I can go back and perform my review and analysis. So before we even go any further, like, I think it's, it'd be fair and rational for me to go back and review it again and to see where we should go from there. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, Natasha. Okay. So regarding the reason why we brought NYPD here and Manny speaking, are we have any other questions for him before moving on? Well, would it be possible? Well, to get a copy of the NYPD's um, policies and procedures related to, to this. I don't room. know if we have the authority to ask for that or not at this time. Oh, we can ask. Maybe they'd voluntarily give it to us. The commission wants to just follow up uh, with any items in writing and we can send it to NYPD, the legal bureau we'll review and we'll, uh, we can provide any information to be helpful. To the commission. Okay. Anything else? Okay, we'll move on then. Did, I did have just one other question about the SNP information that is uh, released to the NYPD to do their search. Um, and if I'm using not uh, precise um, terminology, I'll uh, apologize in advance. Um, is there specific uh, wording in any sort of documents that accompany the profile or the, the SNP data that says that it's being released for the express purpose for a particular case? So in other words, we're, we're investigating a case, we are getting this data, and it's only supposed to be used to try to um, provide, be an investigative aid for one particular case. That's my question. I think that question would be best answered by direct to Parabon and Bodhi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, we're going to move into uh, probabilistic genotyping. At our last commission meeting, uh, commission member, <clears throat> excuse me, Goldthwait withdrew a motion to request uh, labs provide specific data points regarding the issue of Using, using probabilistic genotyping. Uh, the request evolved from a discussion on the draft NIST report regarding mixture interpretation and a vote to require labs to provide their operating procedures and validations of probabilistic genotyping to the subcommittee for their analysis of the NIST document once it's finalized. Uh, Ms. Goldthwaite has provided a list of data that could be provided to determine the use of probabilistic genotyping in New York. 
as well as a public comment to the NIST draft by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Um, I would open it for discussion, but again, I would just like to take pause and, and make note that the NIST document is still not finalized. Um, there was a second open comment period for it, and um, so it's still under review. With that, Anne? Um, I just uh, had a question. Just said you um, mentioned in your letter that you believe that at least Erie County is using probabilistic uh, uh, genotyping because they've submitted their validation several years ago, but they submitted it to the DNA subcommittee. You mentioned that you think there are at least uh, I think two other labs that are doing it and three that are getting ready or the other way around. Um, there are only five DNA labs in New York State, I believe. So does that mean all of our DNA approved labs from DCJS are using probabilistic genotyping? No, there's, there's, there's more than five. There are? How many are there, Jill? I believe there's eight, nine if you include the data bank as a DNA lab. Okay. Could All be right. wrong. That's okay. off the top of my head and I could be wrong. So I put that out I there. I this then, but that would still mean well over half. Those other labs are using it without having submitted validation to the DNA subcommittee? Do we know? So some of this predates me coming on, but I will say that I do know that Onondaga, I believe, presented in front of the subcommittee. Um, and I'm trying to think, Shelley, can you think of anything else? Um, Onondaga presented in front of the subcommittee in November of 2016, I believe. Okay. Um, and at that time, the subcommittee's minutes represent their um, their position on labs presenting previously approved technologies. So I, we can provide those minutes and you can see the subcommittee's determination, but that's why I believe other labs did not come forward with their validations when they um, finalized those. But there was a, a discussion during that meeting and I'm happy to provide those minutes to everyone. Okay. So, but my, my reading of all this was that if we are seriously concerned about the quality of the validation of this methodology and all of the issues that are raised in the draft report, um, it may get finalized, it may get changed, but at least we're getting ahead of the issues, that it would not seem unreasonable to ask any lab using this technology today, because we are almost seven years beyond the DNA subcommittee having looked at validation for Erie County, um, asking them to submit an updated current status procedure and validation document. My comment about the commission asking to see SOPs and validation data is that it's my impression that historically we have, we the commission, not being the methodological experts in any particular, it, some individuals are, but the commission itself not having, I don't believe, the experience and expertise to be looking at SOPs and validation documents. Um, and certainly in the area of DNA, approval of any of those methods would have to go to the DNA subcommittee. That we would not ask for those documents that in DNA, they would go to the DNA subcommittee. Um, I certainly don't have a file of procedure manuals and validation documents for every method being used in every forensics lab that we've approved. Um, and personally, I would not want to see the um, probabilistic genealogy validation documents for each of eight DNA labs. I'd make no 
useful comment. Um, so I think if somebody wants to see that from the DNA subcommittee, that's fine. Um, but that was my general comment that I don't think it's unreasonable to update the DNA, to ask the DNA subcommittee to update their position on probabilistic genealogy based on review of current documents from the labs using the method. Um, and perhaps that's a good step in the direction of looking at whether or not there are real substantive issues with this method. So I might be inherently wrong on this, and but I just, I feel like all of the labs have provided their SOPs and validations to the Office of Forensic Services. At the time when there's a finalized version of the report, they will be given that information to review so that they can focus on as it pertains to New York State and the, and the functions of yeah. the labs within New York State. Um, so within that, inherently, I think they're doing, they're going to be doing an evaluation of it at that time. Um, I just would suggest that perhaps a, a request would be duplicative of what they're already going to be doing. But um, except, Mike, I'm sorry, except, go ahead, Ann. Well, except that asking ANAB to do that or expecting ANAB to do that and are doing that, I think Jessica would agree is a very different process. And yes, we get ANAB's comments on the status of that review. All right. But right. that's that's different than her request, which no, is but in this circumstances, the DNA subcommittee will have the the validations yes. and the SOPs. Because yes. they've already been requested and they will have them. So they will be doing another review of those as it pertains to the NIST um, report. I I'm not sure if that Money's the water or credit report for, for the final NIST report when that comes out. That's what we've requested of them as a commission. Oh, and they haven't done it yet. They can't do that because there's not a finalized version of the NIST paper. Ah, so they're going to take the NIST report and get the validation and procedure manuals from all of the DNA labs relevant to genealogy and do to a comparison report. Probabilistic, right? So probabilistic genotyping okay. and do the work. Then, and until then, we then see, make a recommendation to us as a commission, and then we can comment and discuss. And until we see that, I just I don't know that we can really have a conversation. Yeah, no, I understand it, but a couple points. Um, one, just to clarify, right at the last meeting, um, I think the commission voted unanimously to require labs to send that are using probabilistic genotyping to send the documentation um, to OFS for the DNA subcommittee. And that, and you're saying, Jill, that was in fact done. All labs have complied with our directive. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I am making a request as a commissioner <laughs> to see those things. I, right in the process, I can speak as the public defense representative. I need to understand this stuff um, in order to properly represent clients. And as a commission member, I think, um, it's very important to see um, what New York labs are doing. And I think just even some of the questions we've been raising throughout this meeting is we have no idea what's going on. I mean, I'm sure the uh, OFS knows and each person, each individual lab probably knows what all the other labs in New York are doing, but we're the oversight um, a commission and we don't actually know what's happening um, in New York. And that's, Oh, I believe she froze. It appears she might have lost. Um, yeah, I think connection. she's currently dealing with low bandwidth. Yeah, so I did see Mike. I did see you raise your hand. I'm not sure if you wanted to say something in the meantime. Sure. Um, I think that it's it's relevant. How it's actually important. being used oh. in our oh. sense. Sorry, oh, Jessica, you had you had froze, so we're not quite sure. Oh, where did I stop? Good, because I was tripping over words, so maybe that was uh, maybe oh. that was serendipitous. <laughs> what did I last say? But we don't know what the labs are doing. Okay, right. We don't know what the labs are doing. We don't know what the but I, 
I feel compelled to kind of go back to the, the structure of the process, which is that we have a DNA subcommittee for a purpose. Those are the experts in the field and we defer to them for that evaluation because as commission members, we don't have that expertise. Um, if you are making a request to see the documents themselves, um, I mean, in the past we have done that. It, it's voluminous come to Albany and, and look at them. I would have to consult with Natasha and see if that's what we would normally do. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know how much further we can go right now. The other thing, Jill, that I think we need to remind ourselves is not only do we have a DNA subcommittee for their expertise and their advice, but we have delegated our oversight, our physical visits to our review of procedures and cases to an accrediting organization rather than the Office of Forensic Sciences or the Commission itself taking on those obligations to actually visit labs, do inspections, um, review cases. That's done by ANAB. Now we can ask ANAB whatever we want. We can next visit, next review of documents. Um, We've not done field trips to the labs. And I understand just from my history mm -hmm. that I've argued 20 something years ago that DCJS and OFS should have established a model much more like the Department of Health, where the agency itself did the surveys, inspected the labs, had its own staff that responded to the commission. That's, the resources would not have allowed that then, and we've never made that transition. So we have delegated all of that oversight to organizations other than ourselves. A flaw in the system, I will agree, but right. historic. I'm gonna go to Mike, because I know that he was gonna say something and then Pat, I know you, and I'm fairly certain Jessica sure. will go back. Um, I just want to mention, um, and and, and uh, uh, Anne brought it up, but it, it is relevant that the uh, um, validations are reviewed during accredita the accreditation process, auditing process, and they're not done by, uh, well, I should rephrase, they are done by subject matter experts, right? So you are getting experts that are trained in, in accreditation and auditing reviewing these validations. If you weren't qualified uh, to uh, perform or, or didn't have subject area expertise in probabilistic genotyping, you couldn't be auditing it, right? So I think that's a, a relevant uh, point to make. And one uh, other uh, additional point is that the NIST report did not address laboratory validation and accreditation in it. Okay, it talked about there being a lack of um, publicly available data, but it didn't talk about the lab's accreditation process. And again, it's a draft document, so there could be changes, uh, but I think that's a very relevant uh, point. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pat? Uh, Mike just brought up half my point, but in, in, in addition to, for the DNA sections, in addition to the A and A B criteria plus the, um, the AR document, we also go through a QAS audit. So we have two separate audits. One is A and A B, one is by the QAS FBI document. Uh, and I do believe that they don't get memorialized until two consecutive Inspections, so they're reviewed. They're reviewed twice, just like people's training records and so forth before they're memorialized. So you actually have the opportunity to get a review from two separate audits. So there's more out there for uh, anyone who's interested in seeing um, the audit information, the validation information, and so forth. I I I, I agree. I think this needs to get pushed back to the. Uh, the subcommittee, I, I, I was actually uh, firsthand involved in validation because I'm still a technical leader here. So I did a lot of the permutations, a lot of the runs and so forth, but I'm just not comfortable getting eight to 10 
validation projects from around the state and assuring that I've done a good enough job because of the volume that's coming through. So I think it's something that needs to get pushed back again and and see where it goes. I know someone had mentioned that it's not fair to push it back again because they've already done this and approved it once, but I'm in favor of, of, of saying, okay, is there some record, some notification? Has, has uh, Bruce done any write-up for the state yet, Joe? Not for the state, no. Okay. All right. So, and but this is stuff that's in the process, right? Okay. Anyone else, Jessica? Yeah. Um, thanks. I mean, sure. Right. We we do delegate um, part of our responsibility to ANAB, um, and then certainly DNA subcommittee has the subject matter expertise, but we are still ultimately responsible. Um, as an oversight commission, and I think the fact that we don't have a clear idea of uh, the level of complexity of forensic DNA casework um, being interpreted by our public labs in New York is a real problem uh, because uh, the NIST report, and I understand it's a draft report, but uh, you know, it's like a check engine light coming on, right? It's on, um, even if it is a, a draft report, they're raising serious questions about whether there's sufficient evidence for re reliable use um, in actual casework. And that is highly dependent on what individual labs are doing. In addition to how the software developer develops uh, the software, it also depends on how the lab tests it internally and, and applies it. Um, and we just, don't have any idea what they're doing. Um, so, yes, I, I do think the DNA subcommittee, of course, um, has to review this thing. I would just stress, and I, I hope I made it clear in the letter, um, if I didn't, let me make it clear now, is I don't think it, um, it helps us execute successfully our oversight responsibilities if we simply get a letter from the DNA subcommittee saying we find reliable period. Because I think the whole point of the NIST Mixture Foundation Review was to move away from such uh, blanket statements, um, reliable, not reliable, right? Because it depends, any uh, method depends on what you're using it on. And, um, you know, reliability is going to be more seriously challenged and, and reduced, right? With the more complex uh, mixtures, um, which also goes into the data point, right? So, um, that's why I made the request that when the DNA subcommittee performs its review for our benefit and for the public's and theirs, that um, there's more information given than just a simple, we find this reliable uh, in a short letter. And th there should be some identifiable criteria, and I suggest NIST and IEEE, that are used in um, evaluating uh, these validations. Because the whole point of NIST is you can't just say reliable, not reliable. You have to look at the evidence um, that the lab and the developers have created um, for the reliable use on any particular case, which, um, they're really complex cases, right? Like we just got informed that OCME is now moving to four person mixtures with a more advanced uh, version of Starmix. I think there are labs in the state that are going beyond four person mixtures. Again, we need to know this, but we have received a, a case report and past commission materials that indicated this is so. Um, so, so we're at a, a moment of enormous, um, I, we're at a we're at a moment where we should pause, and instead of pausing, um, instead of laps pausing, they're just speeding up. And um, you know, my concern is for the unreliable use of evidence in in prosecutions uh, in New York. Um, I will say this uh, with respect to the motion I made last time; it was too narrow. Uh, so I realized that afterwards, but. The whole NIST Mixture Foundation review was not just on probabilistic genotyping, although that is clearly the, the trend um, in, in the country uh, for interpretation of complex mixtures. But there are other methods um, like, uh, you know, manual interpretation, subjective interpretation, um, and those can have serious problems. Um, Especially, I, you know, we're all familiar with the example of the combined probability of inclusion. I mean, labs, right, have been shut down for uh, misusing this. So, I, you know, I think I would, um, I'm going to make the motion again because 
The way I see it as the public defense representative is thousands of people are being prosecuted uh, with evidence produced from the interpretation of complex mixtures uh, without sufficient evidence of their reliability in, in a particular case. Um, so I am going to renew my motion, but I'm going to broaden it uh, because it is more than just probabilistic genotyping. And I'm going to call again for a moratorium on the interpretation of complex DNA mixtures until such time as an independent body can assess the reliability of the use of the methods. Okay, so a motion uh, has I, been made. Oh, any I comments? A, I have a clarification to ask. What what mm -hmm. does complex mean? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, when I was thinking this through and deciding I am going to make this motion again, that's part of the problem, right? But if necessary for us to propose the motion, I mean, we can try to define it, but the problem is, is anytime you try to define it, you're going to leave um, things out. So, you know what? I, I'm going to take your point and modify my motion to say an interpretation of DNA mixtures for exactly that reason. So, I'll drop the complex. You're right. So your motion is that you are requesting a moratorium on the interpretation of DNA mixtures by public forensic laboratories in New York State? Yes. There's a motion. Do we have a second? I think Ben was seconding, but he's mute, muted. I'll second for purpose of bringing it to a vote. Okay, Ben seconds. With that, we will take a vote um i'll start jill, my vote. yes jill, i'm sorry I, I i i lost track of what the actual um what the motion was and i'm sorry no nope, a motion uh and again jessica please correct me if i'm wrong that uh, there uh we issue a moratorium on the interpretation of dna mixtures by dna labs in new york state is that correct jessica well, there is an important end to that, which is until such time as an independent body can assess the reliability, right? Because I'm not saying, um, and it, my point really is direct at complex, but Mike, your, your point is well taken. Um, I'm not saying this stuff will never be reliable or cannot be reliably used, right? There may be simple two-person mixtures where uh, methods are completely um, reliable, but um, you know, so I'm not saying this is a forever thing, but given this conclusions um, and given the fact that our DNA subcommittee hasn't reviewed validations in in years, um, it's appropriate to pause uh, so that New Yorkers aren't being prosecuted with unreliable methods. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, this, but it, this, I think, goes back to the whole um how complicated this issue is i think we do need to use the word complex and and mike i take your point completely but um if we need to have a separate motion or if we need to refer to the nist report for their definition of complexity which is admittedly fluid uh, because it has to be but I, I you know i was trying to solve the problem but i'm not sure that that really advances the ball so here's my motion um I call for a moratorium on the interpretation of complex um, DNA mixtures until such time as an independent body can assess the reliability of the methods being used. Can you clarify an independent body? Is I'm not exactly sure yep. who that. No, would fair be. enough, fair enough. Um, I this is um, discussed in the PCAST report. It's discussed in the IEEE letter. Uh, as well that I attach to to my letter to the commission and DNA subcommittee. Um, but I would argue it has to be independent um, association financially from, it can't be the developer and it can't be the users, right? So it can't be the labs or um, the users, uh, but there has to be a greater degree of independence. Um, uh, I think there's a good description, the IEEE letter, um, but there has to be financial independence, conflict of interest, you know, independence uh, to make sure that it's it's a truly independent review. Kind of so I have a question. So does that mean that this is also precluding the subcommittee as an independent body? If the subcommittee, I mean, are they independent of all the developers? I 
That's the question. No. And I'm not sure that's true. And, and, Maybe it is. I, I, I'm not saying one way or the other. It's a good question, Lydia. Now, is NIST a customer? I'm, I'm sure they probably have uh, some licenses for ProbGen software. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think for this purpose, yes, NIST um, would be an appropriate body, right? But sure, maybe uh, even another independent third party. All right, this is something that has to be figured out. <laughs> what is so? So I'm supposed to stop rape investigations in Onondaga County because of a, a report that hasn't been finalized yet? Star Mix has been examined in multiple courtrooms throughout the country, and we think our judges are independent. It's been scientifically challenged. There are issues that will be continue to be addressed. By statute, we are required to accept the DNA subcommittee's findings or findings as binding on us. We've done that multiple times. These labs are all accredited, and we're seriously now considering whether or not to put a moratorium on criminal investigations involving biological samples in the state of New York. I, I just, I, you know, I, I love these meetings. I know we spent 40 minutes talking about footprints, but we, we ought to be dealing with more substantive and serious matters than this. So let's get on with the vote if we can. I would just add that I can't imagine something being more uh, substantive than uh, determining the reliability of use of evidence in a process. Which has been done multiple, multiple times. And an your, your, state, your statement that, that we don't know what's going on in New York State laboratories is patently wrong. Okay, so with that, let's just continue Hi, on guys, with the vote. Can we possibly just wait? I mean, I, I know, I mean, you raised a lot of important points here, but I think we should just wait to hear back one, the report isn't finalized. We should just wait until it's finalized. Um, that, that's just my, just right now we're <laughs> going back and forth. I mean, we should just wait for that and see what the DNA subcommittee says. Um, so we, what are we doing? We're not, we're not, we're, not <laughs> we're at an impasse right now. So um, it, it seems like, so, I mean, let's just wait. And like I said, it's not finalized. I know Jessica, I hear what you said, you know, once the light is on, it's on, and I, and, you know, I hear you and I hear everyone else, but let's just see what the final report says. With the procedure, though, Natasha, we did have a motion and we did have a second. Do we still have to continue with the vote? Yes, yes unless they want to withdraw the motion and the, the second. <laughs> is there willingness to withdraw the motion or we still want to proceed with the vote? Jessica. Um, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about waiting. I think we're all eagerly waiting for, um, you know, the finalized uh, NIST report. Um, but, it, you know, we don't know how long it's going to take unless somebody here does know. That would be great information. Um, but I think we have to vote given that this is still continuously being used um, in literally thousands of prosecutions. So I, I would still like to go forward with the vote. Although I do Proceed. understand the. Proceed with the vote then. When I call on you, please state your vote for the record. Uh, my vote is no. I know the commissioner's having connection issues. Um, um, Jill? Yes. This is Joe Popkin. I have the commissioner on the line for the roll call. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, again, just to reiterate, uh, we're taking a vote on the motion that uh, Ms. Goldthwaite has made and Ben has seconded. And what is your vote? Sorry, she's a she's a second behind on the YouTube. She's on a delay, so we'll wait. Commissioner, again, just to reiterate, uh, we're taking a uh, vote on the motion that uh, both ways have made and seconded. My vote is no. Thank you. Continuing on, Pat? Not in favor. No. Lydia? No. Bill? No. Jessica? Yes. Judge? No. 
Mike? No. Ben? No. Yes. Ben votes yes. Superintendent? No. And Anne? No. And with that, the motion does not carry. Moving on to the next part of our agenda, we are going to discuss laboratory disclosures. First up is the Erie County Central Police Services. Um, this is a closure notification of a nonconformance regarding a DNA reporting error. The fifth report of a case was issued with an incorrect conclusion. The error was noted by the ADA when reviewing report four and five. The lab concluded its investigation of the nonconformance and it was determined to be an isolated incident. Do we have any questions for the laboratory? Hearing none, we'll move on. Next up is the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office, a forensic toxicology laboratory with a fentanyl issue. This is an initial notification of an issue involving the reporting of fentanyl quantitation results. The values reported in the particular case uh, seem to be too high. And the samples were sent to a private lab for reanalysis. The results varied by a factor of two from the original, uh, the lab's original value. All fentanyl analysis has been stopped while the lab investigates the nonconformance. Again, this is an initial notification. So once they um, uh, do a root cause and, and close out, they will be back again on the agenda with that information. But do we have any questions in the meantime? Uh, I had a, a question for the lab. If we could get, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Melissa Bowler on the line. I think she's on the line. Just raise her hand and unmute her. Thank you, Melissa. You're, You're unmuted. Thanks. Hey, this is Melissa, the Erie County uh, Chief Toxicologist. Hey. Um, so I understand the disclosure relates uh, to fentanyl. Um, has there been any investigation into whether measurements for other substances are also off? Like, how do you know it's just limited to, to fentanyl, I guess is my question. Right, the fentanyl is part of an opioid panel and um, we've ran proficiencies with caps on them that have opioids in them and all of them have come back with uh, acceptable ranges. Um, so that's how we know no other opioids were affected. Okay. Um, and have you expanded past opioids or is there no reason to do so based on this? Yes, there's no reason to do so since we passed all other proficiencies. Okay. Um, and so what is happening with casework uh, involving fentanyl right now? We don't report out any fentanyls um, quantitatively. Um, any, uh, all cases have been uh, stopped for opioid testing and we're currently investigating it. Okay. Um, and, and has uh, the defense and the prosecution been, been notified of this? Um, so I'm not uh, aware of the official notification, um, but they have uh, cases where we have um, reference lab um, numbers for fentanyl on them. So they know that we are not currently reporting out any fentanyl cases. Sorry, just to be clear, have you disclosed um, to, to the prosecution? The uh, prosecution or... does know, yes. Okay. Okay, and but you've made no independent effort to disclose to the defense. No. Okay. okay moving you. on. Uh, moving on, we will go to the Nassau County Medical Examiner uh, Division of Forensic Services. This is an initial notification of an incident in the chemistry section involving missing evidence. The laboratory has initiated a quality investigation and corrective action. Um, upon their investigation, they will do a closeout and it will be back again on our agenda. Does anyone have any questions at this time? And just a, a quick one on on page 91 of the materials, the disclosure indicates uh, it's the second bullet point um, that a quality investigation is being done, but there doesn't appear to be any disclosure that this item of evidence was misplaced or lost and can't be found. So I don't know if it 
you know, what's being conveyed, particularly if it reaches, you know, the defendant's representative is really adequate. I just encourage, you know, more explicit language rather than item seven, no analysis due to a quality investigation. It's really no analysis because the item is missing. Doesn't it say like at the beginning of the letter uh, 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 that it's one alleged oxycodone tablet? Paragraph one, on September 2nd, the case analyst discovered that there's a blank, item seven, one alleged oxycodone tablet went missing. Pat, you're muted. Oh, I'm unmuted, but I, if, oh. if if anyone needs me to speak on this point, I think we, we have Mark involved, but I, I think I can speak on this one. Um, so the case report itself, which is also discoverable, does have contact and so forth within the case file. So it's not that we're saying there's a quality issue, you're not allowed to know what it is. The documentation is within the technical record and the administrative record of the case file. And um, Mark, if you're on and I'm misspeaking or not speaking accurately, could you um, uh, at some point, I guess, we'll phone in if we need to. But the, the case record contains the information, which is part of the discovery. Thanks. I'm, I missed that at the top that Judge Mazzarelli pointed out. No problem. Okay. Any other questions? Moving on, we'll go to the New York City Police Department uh, Police Laboratory. This is a closure of a nonconformance involving a macro coding error in the seized drug discipline. Um, the cause analysis committee determined the level of documentation required at the time of the coding error was not formalized, um, that there was only one single member of the staff with expertise in macro coding. The corrective action includes training more staff and using software to detect coding changes to verify that the intended changes were made. Do we have any questions or conversation for that? Moving on then, we have the New York State Police Crime Laboratory. Um, the first nonconformance is an initial notification of an issue involving the footnote omission in biology reports. The conclusions reported were correct, uh, but the footnote had been inadvertently changed. This affected 80 reports. The laboratory is conducting a root cause analysis and a and AB has acknowledged the receipt of that notification. So with that, again, it's an initial notification An investigation will be done and it will uh, return to our agenda um, during closeout. Any questions on that personal <laughs> conformance? Hearing none, we'll move to the second nonconformance is the initial notification of a seized drug analyst incorrectly entering analytical notes into their limb system for item three under the notes for item two. Uh, this produced a report with an incorrect analytical result. The submitting agency was notified and the laboratory is conducting a root cause analysis. Again, initial notification, investigation will be done. It will return to our agenda upon closeout. Any questions? Pat, you're raising I, your I, bad hand. <laughs> it's fake. It doesn't really hurt. Okay. Um, I don't even have a question for Ray. I'm asking other commissioners, and, and I'm pretty sure, because there was a lot of information for this meeting, but uh, I do believe the TR was also being investigated in this case. I have Ray that has raised his hand as well. Okay. I'm I'm unmute sure Ray, and we can just confirm that the hey, you're muted. reviewer is also part of this. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yeah, we'll absolutely be looking um, at our entire system, uh, including the technical review. So uh, thank you for pointing it out, but we will be looking not only at the uh, analyst, but the entire system, just how that slipped through. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ray. Any other questions or comments? Okay, the next item on the agenda is executive session. 
Do I have a motion to go in executive session to discuss matters relating to current investigation or matters that may lead to the appointment, promotion, demotion, discipline, or suspension of a particular person? So moved. Bill's made a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I believe Mike was first to have seconded the motion. When I call on you, please state your vote for the record. My vote is yes. Uh, I don't believe, is Commissioner Rosado still on? She is, I'm just trying to confirm the phone number. She has called in. Okay. If she could raise her hand, that would be really helpful, please. So, Commissioner, if you could press star three. Right, I'm not seeing her. I'll just move on temporarily and come back to her once we've we've figured that out. Okay, Pat, your vote. Yes. Lydia. Yes. Bill. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Sorry. Judge. Yes. Mike. Yeah. Ben. Yes. Superintendent. Yes. Ann. Yeah. And do we have the commissioner? Do we have the commissioner on the line over here. Over there. Okay. Commissioner, and commissioner. to move into an executive session. Yes. Her vote is yes. Okay. At this point, if you are not a commission member or representative or staff, you will be expelled from the virtual meeting and the streaming will be paused. The stream will resume when executive session has ended. If all the commission members could please mute themselves and we'll await for our directive from Elizabeth as to when we're ready to commence. Thank you. Also, Jill, if you want to take a 5 minute break for people to turn off their cameras for if they need, we have a little bit of time. Yes, would you like to resume at 1235? 1235 is the time I will set a timer. As you know, I'm an efficient time bug, so we'll see you back then. Thanks guys. Everybody, if you could just still stay muted, please. Thank you. And Elizabeth, could you potentially call the commissioner to add her to the WebEx possible? Just a second. I had dialed in and I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. We well, were muted at that moment, Commissioner. If you want to call back, um, then I can go ahead and put you back in. Okay, let me hang on the call back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We are now back live on YouTube and we're now being recorded as well in the WebEx. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we are back from executive session where no action was taken. I would just like to say uh, the next meeting uh, will be March 4th of 2022. The location is still be to be determined. Um, we are hopeful it will be in person. We will keep you posted. Um, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Bill's made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Pat second. I'll call on you to state your vote for the record and then we will be done. Thank you so much. My vote is yes. Commissioner? Yes. Pat? Yes. Lydia? Yes. Bill? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Judge? Yes. Mike. Yes. Ben. Yes. Superintendent. Yes. Anne. Yes. And with that, we are adjourning. Thank you, everyone. I just want to thank the commission members for taking the time for today's meeting to prepare and also the, the vibrant discussions that we've had. And also thanks so much to the staff for everything that they've done to pull this meeting off. Everyone have a great holiday season and we will see you back in March. Thanks. Great Thanks. job, Jill. Same to everybody.
Excellent. Great. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you Take care, everyone. Happy holidays. 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 Happy